What's happening? All right. Can you hear me, everybody? Uh, this is the first time that I'm going to be using this, uh, the, that I'm going to be doing the slap stream from my phone. For some reason, my computer stopped working. I tried to do the um, uh, sound check half an hour ago, and I've been struggling a lot, and it's not working. It's not working. And I finally figured it out how to do it from my phone. So hopefully you can hear me. And what's mo more important, you're going to be able to hear and see my guest for today. So I already see a bunch of people here. And uh, let me see who's here. Carolyn, happy Slapper Day. Who's going to Silverado Showdown? I'm not because I'm not in California. I'm in Europe at the moment. Um, Charlie, Publica, and Estrepiva. Yes, they are there. Uh, hi, Mark, uh, let me see how this works in, it works the same. Uh, yeah, it's so good to see you all. It had been like a couple of weeks when I was, um, not available to do this, uh, and, but I'm back. So last week, hopefully you enjoyed, the uh, the last week's episode with Slam Stewart. Um, I plan occasionally to feature some of the, I mean, to present some of these unreleased interviews. So I hope you enjoy those as well. Slam Stewart is an excellent slapper. I mean, he's mostly famous for his bowing and singing, but but for uh, for his slapping is great. Just check out his the songs um, B19 or I Got Rhythm with Don Bias. And um, what was the other one? Grooving or something. I'll, I'll remember it. So, all right, Antonio. Hi, Antonio. And hi, Mark. I'm glad I'm back as well. Well, I'm in Serbia. I'm not in 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 uh, California, but Slapstream is here, and I have a excellent guest as well. So. I want to say thanks to everyone that bought these t-shirts. I want to uh, say thanks to everyone that subscribed to the channel. If you haven't subscribed, make sure to click that subscribe button and like the video. And also um, for all of you that joined the Patreon, that helps the most. So if you're considering helping me out with all these adventures and continuing with the slap stream, make sure to Check out the Patreon. All the links are below this video. Um, yes, I agree, Carolyn. Both of those interviews, it was like kind of like a two interviews in one, but it was amazing. You know, I, I enjoyed listening to those a lot. And thanks a lot to Bo Sample, who gave me actually and uh, that, that interview. Hey, Labashri, and hey, Chuck. And hey, Andrew. So hello, everybody. So hopefully nobody going to call me on my phone. I'll, I should probably put it on airplane mode or something. Anyway, so without further ado, I want to uh, introduce my guest for today. And I have to figure out how I'm going to be able to do that. I think this is it. Add to stream. Hey, Didi, I figured it out. <laughs> Yes. Hey, daughter. Hey, daughter. Oh man. Hey, George. I, I did a couple of things during the Corona thing, and none yes. in time. Yes. So, I, I want to ask. I, I, I want to ask our viewers if they they can hear you fine as well. They can hear me fine. So, hopefully, everything is fine now, so we can start the interview. But I'm really glad to hear you. I'm really glad to uh, hear you and to see you. Seems you're well. You know, every time I go to Germany, you know, we, we hang out for a bit. This is the time that we're hanging out online as well. Maybe we can do this more often. Uh, but we have, you know, the audience. So it's great. Um, so first of all, how have you been doing? How, how are you surviving the pandemic? How are you, uh, how are you dealing with this whole craziness? And uh, the people are saying that you have certain echo. So there's a button that you can that you can click that says delete echo or something. If you can click that, great. If not, let's just continue with this. Uh, 
Is it better it's now? Better. Um, I, think, I think it's better. Better? I mean, I can hear you fine, you know, as long as yeah. everyone else yeah. is, hears you fine as well. So, yeah. but yeah. go ahead. You know, I want to hear what you're, you know, what you're, uh, yeah. how you've been doing. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's yeah. health, you know, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's combined it's with, with Japanese too. Yeah. <laughs> Not that perfect. Not that perfect. Uh, yeah, but now yeah. you're gone. Yeah. Georgia, yeah. I don't know where you are. Somewhere, Somewhere in the line, please come yeah. out. Show me your beautiful face. Yeah. Let me see how I can go back to you. Know, I can hear you, but uh, ah, here it is. Ah. <laughs> it's not a bit slap stream. Um, I'm in Serbia, so I'm in Serbia. I'll be here for a little bit, and then I'm going to back go 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 back to Los Angeles. And I see that things in Los Angeles are uh, getting to be much better. You know, lots of people are vaccinated, and you know you can dine inside, and you know there's like some shows come, coming up. I think that today or tomorrow is uh, Silverado Showdown with Necromantics, Jesse Dayton, Delta Bombers. Yeah. Yeah. A few Kim, Kim, oh, mentioned, yeah. Yeah, Kim mentioned yeah, Kim that Kim on, mentioned on Facebook. Facebook. He, he made a posting about that show, show Kim Nickelman. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. I'm so happy for the American musicians that they can, can come back can this summer. summer. Unfortunately, no, I think in Germany, in Germany uh, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. Things went difficult since the last harvest. I think the first time when, when the coronavirus started, we're getting very good through all the things, but things from harvest on, things went bad, and they are all totally afraid of dying immediately. Everyone. We will all die. And so, uh, and, and, and the, the point is for us as musicians. Uh, we feel like to be the last one. We are forgotten. You can buy, you can produce cars, you can produce weapons. That's not dangerous. But making music, you will die. You really will die if you can make music. You're an audience. That doesn't feel good. So it's not that easy for me. And, um, you know, I have a crazy hobby. I'm a runner. I run marathons. And that helps a lot going through the coronavirus situation. And I write a lot of songs. I practice a lot. And, uh, yeah, I have several stream concerts. And that helps a lot. That's great. I mean, you know, some people are not able to practice at all. And you practice a lot. So yeah. That, yeah. That, that's great. Um, so Didi has a bad echo and feedback, and they told me that I, I think the truth is on, on my feedback is on my end as well. All right, I'll try headphones. Maybe Didi yeah. can try headphones. Yeah. Thanks for the feedback. Might be from my phone. I don't know, but you know, you never know with these live streams, you know? Oh, what's going to happen? Do you have a... Uh, you, okay, <laughs> let's try that. Yeah. You're first. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Give me a second. You see this one? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I, have, I only have I only have a studio headphone, and but that doesn't work with the computer. Ah, okay, okay. So do it whatever you have to do, and then luckily we have all these patients. Yeah, but yes, yeah, uh, you know that they're checking out, letting us know. Let me start from what I'm doing here now. Um, it's a uh, lesson for every bass player. Let your run. Well. well, yeah. It's like, oh, like old bass things you have in the box and you put them back on your bass and too. You like, you like that. Ah, shit. shit. I noticed that you started practicing with Bopping Bop and B. Is, are you guys yeah. going to play yeah. any shows soon? Uh, mm, yeah, the streaming shows. Ah, uh, streaming shows, okay. Uh, so wait, so wait, wait. So, can you talk to me? Oh, I, I can talk to you. So, sure. is it, so is, is, what's up with my echo? I think that you can have to change the setting like to a different microphone. Uh, I'm not sure yeah, if that's... Yeah. 
Yeah, but I, hear, use, yeah. I use the internal I microphone. Oh, it's my end. They told me that it's my end. Okay. So I'll get the headphones and I will let you talk. Um, <laughs> and actually, why don't you play? Why don't you play a, a, a song, you know, for everyone, you know, while I set up this? Yeah. And I'm really yeah. sorry that I have these issues. Okay. So, I'll try, I'll, I'll try to. So everybody in the house, you know, I'm a big fan. Well, maybe most of you know, I'm a real big fan of Mr. Cho, Cho Tinken. If you don't know him, I think most of you know Cho Tinken. And uh, it's funny, I see my head like, oops. I don't care about that too much. Uh, Mr. Cho Tinken, a great, great player. And I do a thing called um, Four Leaf Clover. Yeah, that's that's one of the um, one of the best slap bass tunes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, is it better? I think it's better. So I don't right. have an echo now. Yeah, and you're looking great with those nice headphones. Like okay, you're in the studio. Okay. Right? Let's see. Yes. Okay. Well, Tommy loved your playing and rocking bats and Jason and wash hands. That apparently means uh, clap hands. Okay, so much better. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, everyone. So hopefully everyone can hear me now. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Wow, you got a lot of these. So it's, it's, it's kind of harder like to click on all of these while I'm on the phone, but but it is what it is. Okay, cool, great. So now we finally figured out all these technical issues yeah. <laughs> while I'm flipping my phone. And um, it's interesting all because right. usually, you know, when I'm in California, it's it's very bright at this time of the day and now it's pretty dark. Um, Here too. Cool, Here too. great, yes. Glad, uh, well, we're in the same time zone now. So that's great. Uh, all right, let's start with your beginning. So I want to hear, like, how did you start uh, being interested in music? How did you start being interested to be uh, uh, an upright bass player? How old were you when you started playing bass? And all that fun stuff that everyone wants to know. That's a great question. And as you know me, that can take hours for, to answer. Yes, I'm interested in, uh, in music when I was about six or eight years old. Um, I was sleeping in my in my sleeping room apartment. Uh, beside there were neighbors, and they always listened to a band. I don't know if you know them worldwide, but it's called Boney M. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Nice. And uh, there was one bass line. I forgot the song. I think it's is this Rasputin or something like that, or Mark Baker or something like that. But I never forgot the bass line. That was hammered in my head because they did it all one year every evening. And when I was trying to sleep as a six-year-old boy, 
And um, yeah, I think that was the first thing. And uh, later words, uh, I was singing in a church choir, the typical stuff. Then, uh, then there came the sports air, uh, phase. Um, and uh, when I was 14 years old, I went to a cinema and I saw a film called Monterey Pop. I also think mm. you know it. Uh, maybe the first big open air festival that took place in uh, Monterey uh, in 1967. And I saw Jimmy, all those great artists. But uh, one one guy was the one to fix me, uh, was uh, Jimi Hendrix playing Wild Thing. And at the end of the song, he smashed his guitar, burned <laughs> it. Went totally crazy, and you saw all these hippies sitting downstairs, and they didn't. They, you saw the faces, and it, it was totally madness. And I said, "Wow, that's it. That's rock and roll." I, I, I think I didn't say rock and roll, but that what that was the thing I wanted to do in my life. But so, did you want to play guitar, or you actually wanted to play bass? No, I want to burn a guitar and play bass. No. I, I think uh, when I look back now for all those years playing music, I think the point that catched me at that at that uh, movie picture was the energy, that wild, furious energy. That totally, for me, Jimi Hendrix is something very special. There's so much, I can't describe it in good English words. Sorry for that. But uh, And um, some years later, but I decided to be a musician. My best friend was a drummer. And he said, ah, oh, forget all those guitar players. Everybody wants to play guitar. It's boring. And uh, to be true, I need a bass player for my band. And if you want to play with me in the band, buy a bass. I thought it was a good idea. The bass felt well. I played in a band with my friend. And uh, so things went on. I played an electric bass. I started very soon playing the fretless electric bass because at that time I was listening to bands like uh, Paul Young with Pino Palladino on the on the electric fretless bass and there was a band called Brand X uh, where um, Phil Phil Collins was playing the drums and the, the, the how old were you at that time? 15, 16. I started with 14 okay. like, then went very soon to the fretless because Brand X with Percy Jones, furious fretless player. And um, when I was about 20 years old, uh, or 18 or 19 years old, uh, I saw um, a German TV show, live TV show called The Rockpalast. Uh, the, 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 the guys from Europe may know that. And uh, I watched it because of U2 and Joe Cocker. And uh, there was a band, uh, the second band in the setup, and they called the Stray Cats. And um, never heard of them. And they started, and it was maybe like the same feel like with Jimi Hendrix. It was so raw, so so pure, so that was rock and roll, and uh, that catched me up. And I I thought Lee Rocker was the coolest guy on the whole earth. The way he played the upright bass, that was unbelievable. Uh, but I thought buying an upright is much too expensive for a worker's son. So um, I went on playing the electric until I met on a, on one of those parties. I met the drummer of Bobby B. He said, our bass player wants to leave us. I have, um, and we have a, an upright bass in the band. And if you like to join the band, you can use the upright bass and uh, and that, that was no question for me because I uh, never forgot that Stray Cats concert. Yeah. Oh, so was the band Rockabilly Band? Yeah, Bob and B. The band I started with uh, playing Rockabilly was Bob and oh, B. Oh, okay. So there was already Bob and B. So your first yeah. Rockabilly Band is Bob and B? Yeah, the first and maybe the last. <laughs> oh, wow. Wait, wait. But so that, that, that band's been going on for how long? 30 years? 35 years? 35 years. Last year, last year we liked to celebrate our 35th celebration. Wow. Yeah. And uh, the necessary thing is that we are still together. Four from five pe people are still together from the beginning, nearly from the beginning. I joined the band one year after they started, and uh, the saxophone player joined the band uh, half a year later, and we are still together. Playing together, the only position that you, always you, ju you 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 just change the singers, right? Yeah, yeah, that is, yeah. It's, it's like an old car. If a singer is broken down, you need a new one. Wow. Uh, 
Yeah, and uh, as you know, the singers are uh, responsible for the girls in front of stage, and uh, maybe. That's <laughs> <laughs> so we, no, uh, I didn't. I didn't know that. You know that. You, you know, I thought that the guy before this last one was also one of the original guys. So, how how many singers do you have? Have you ever had in in the band? Six. I think there were six. Six. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. And the wow. one you saw was the original one, was the 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 fourth. Ah, okay. He, so that's the that's the one that sang. Uh, uh, you uh, believe? What is the Sasha yeah. song? Yeah, 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 yeah. That is the one that. If, uh, if, if you believe, right? Yeah, if you believe, very well. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> and um, he was number four. And okay. He was, he was with the band the longest. He was the longest time singer of the band he was with the band 17 years and uh, then he made the decision to go uh, to to a much more normal life and uh, of course we respected that very much and we're still friends yeah we're hanging out together sometimes when it comes to concerts or yeah he's a good friend still a good friend we're not he's living uh, from my apartment 50 kilometers away and yeah everything's cool um If you're in a pop and beat, it's like being in a family. It's uh, the technicians and uh, all the guys. 35 from. years. What? Wow. I mean, that's that's great. That's really yeah. awesome. You, you and know, you guys you are know. still still doing, you know, new music. You, you just have a new album from last year, right? Yes. Yes. We brought Is it out. The, the Earth uh, Stood Still? Yeah, The Earth Stood Still. It's not. It's one song. One song. Oh, that's a song. I thought that was the name of the album. Okay. It, no, the, the name of the album is Take Care of Your Hair. Ah, okay. But that's also single, right? Yeah, you're, you're right. Okay, got Very it. Right. well informed, that man. <laughs> 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 yeah, this is maybe one reason why your show is successful. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it's, a, it's successful with a very small group of sled bass players. <laughs> yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> But that was the goal, you know, I wanted to make something that it's going to be very specific, and I didn't. I, I was not looking for something that's going to be of huge interest of, you know, regular people, just like, you know, our, us slap weirdos. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. It's like... It's, it, it's interesting that you mentioned... Uh, um, Uh, rock Palace with the Stray Cats, and the one that you saw is probably the first one. They 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 performed Rock Palace twice, right? Oh, I, I only know that one. Maybe they made a, okay. a, a, a one a concert. The the festival was with different bands, and I think they played one time only alone, which is not the Rock ah, Palace. Okay, uh, so that's that, that's a, a indoor or outdoor. Uh, the, the one they played alone was, I think, was an indoor gig, and the festival was so outdoor. You, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I I I've seen both of those. I mean, on mm -hmm. online or, or or on the. I think that they're also released on the DVD, uh, and it's amazing. I mean, especially that indoor one. I thought it was like the best thing ever. So, have you did you go to that show? Have you seen that show live or no? No, as oh, I mentioned, no, okay. I, was, I was a worker's son, and uh, there was not really no money for me. And um, uh, and um, I watched it. We. We made parties in Germany. We, we uh, all the guys met, and uh, yeah, and uh, we're sitting in front of the TV, uh, put a sound system to the uh, TV, and had a rock palace party, drinking beer, checking out the girls, and uh, listening to great music. And um, yeah, for me, uh, there were two or three shows that were absolutely brilliant, and one of these are Stray Cats. And that was the early '80s, right? Yeah, I think it was. Boah. They always tell me, and I always forget it. Uh, I think it was '83. Okay. Four. Yeah. Yeah. That was a wow. great. I'm a, I was a Lee Rocker fan. To be true, I'm still a Lee Rocker fan. For me, he's um, he's the guy who so many bass players started by because they saw him playing, and I think we can. In, enough thank you to Lee Rocker and uh, his influence to us. And of course, and he opened a totally new world for me. That rockabilly thing was like um, before that, rockabilly was fat old men in German beer festivals 
singing bebop lula fat old musician one for the money two for the show that was rockabilly and i thought oh that's boring old fart shit and um yeah the stray cats definitely definitely wasn't that one and um yeah and then i went on and i um went into Johnny Burnett. That was the next one I really digged into very much and, and Gene Winsor and, and then go on and on and on. And um, yeah, and uh, this is the point where I recognize that rockabilly is brilliant music. Yeah, brilliant music form. Absolutely. Do you consider yourself more of an upright bass player or more of an electric bass player? Actually, I would say more an upright bass player. When, okay. Yeah. Uh, you, in the back, you see the, the, the electric basses. <laughs> I'm still an electric bass player. And I was in that small hometown I, I come from, a Schaffenburg nearby Frankfurt. When I was young, I was a bit well known for playing the slap style with the thumb. On, I had, uh, there was a joke in the music scene, name five bands Diddy is not playing with. Uh, uh, I, I think eight to ten bands at every time. Uh, at one time. All the time? Wow. Okay. Every but, 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 afternoon practicing and, and rehearsing. And yeah, that's what I, I liked it. I liked it hanging out with other musicians. Yeah. It's great. I mean, like playing with different bands, you know, and diff especially different style bands, it's the best. You know, for me, it was always, always kind of the most interesting if I was, while I was doing a conservatory and I, while I was playing in a symphony orchestra, if I had a, like a jazz gig or a rock and roll gig or like world music gig, like at night. And then it will be, I would be the most happy, you know, when I had a chance to, uh, to do that. So I can't so, imagine. Yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Really? It's great. So you have a, a, are you formally educated or, uh, you are more mostly self-taught? Mostly self-educated, but there were several teachers. The first teacher, uh, I really liked him a lot, and he showed me some uh, cool riffs on the electric bass, and um, and uh, he showed me how to handle with the girls and all that rock and roll stuff. That was the most important thing. <laughs> but yeah, he was cool, and uh, yeah, I think he lighted the fire in me, and uh, more and more. And uh, but I got a really about two or three years uh, education with Manfred Bründel, which is uh, in Germany, a well-known jazz bass player and also a classical educated player. And he's um, nowadays, he's um, a professor for upright bass and jazz in Weimar. And that was my personal teacher because we had a very small music school and uh, uh, I don't know how he came there, but um, yeah, he was my teacher for three years. Sometimes we were in contact and he was always uh, laughing about the way I was playing when, when his jazz musicians of his band visit him on that school. He always called me and said, come on, Didi, you have to show them what you're doing with the slap bass. That was so funny because they were all laughing. They all only know those jazz kind, pizzicato playing and bowing, but slap oh, wow. Funny so they, that. but they liked they did they like slap or no? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah they liked it because it's energetic and um, yeah I think they loved liked it because they saw me smiling because I'm so happy to play <laughs> and that uh, was what of I, course I and nowadays I think uh, this is something I really uh, like very much is that also jazz players slap in former days uh, at, in Germany. There were no slap, no jazz musicians slapping, and no uh, classical bass player was interested in jazz or in uh, in slap bass playing. Nowadays, these borders they fall down also in Germany and all over. I don't know how it was in in America. I think the, the Americans were more more open minded at that point. Well, I'm not really sure, you know, but I'm I'm doing my best, you know, to fight that, and then to fight that stigma that, you know, slap is only for rockabilly or, or early jazz players. So I want to incorporate, uh, you know, slap more you know into guy? contemporary you know classical and everywhere. You know that guy playing the v uh, Wilhelm Tell overture on slap bass? Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, that is crazy. It's really great. Cool. I love yeah, it. yeah. Yeah, I really love it. You have a phone call? <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I never met him. I forgot what, what is his name, but you know, I, I thought it was cool. You know, I, I always thought that William Tell Overture is, is a cool piece for, for Slap. Yeah, yeah um, you think like that on Slap Sunday. Yeah, well, you know, Slap Bass Sunday was like too much work. I mean, uh, I for all of you new viewers, you know, I was doing for over a year a Slap Bass Sunday series before the Slap stream, but it was like too much work. I mean, just p playing those were like five minutes, but to get somewhere and then ask someone to film me and then this and that, people were stoked to help out, but uh, but it was still like, it, it was just like too much time. I, I just don't yeah. have time for that anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't really. So, get and yeah. yeah, I, I mean, I was determined. I did it for over a year, you know. So, so I mean, those episodes are still out there. They're still on YouTube. So whoever wants to check them out can. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, so have you started? Uh, did, did you learn like to play with the bow as well? A little bit, a little bit. But, oh, okay. Uh, do you, do you my, use it much or not? No, no, no. Just for 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 um, training the ears and um, sometimes I start. Uh, it's the best for that, yeah. Yeah, I, this is something. When I come back to this earth next time, I, I would train it more. I promise. And, and, and how about jazz? Like, how much of your work involves uh, uh, jazz playing? Uh, I train it. I train it regularly. I train it a lot. I love it a lot. But um, um, there is, as you mentioned before, with slap su uh, Sunday, slap uh, slap Sunday, it there is so much work always to do. I really transcribe a lot, which is an unbelievable bunch of work. Um, now I'm recording an uh, an mm -hmm. album for a friend on the electric bass. Then I've write some mm -hmm. songs friend then i'm uh, just want to train my slap technique and uh, yeah there's so much work to be done i have a regularly jazz session every week four or five hours with some young musicians and uh, we are uh, yeah we're jamming together all all, all standards like oh, you 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 still do that yeah yeah we do that oh, that's great yeah we do that outdoor there's, ah wow okay responsible a, a piano play, uh, standing outdoor uh, at, at a place and we meet there and then sometimes people come around bring beer with them and we are playing jazz standards like uh, the last times we played so what for the first time i like that a lot that's great uh, i think that you know playing jazz really helps out uh with uh with not much, too much with your stamina, but you know, understanding with music and then how these scales fit the chords and you know, applying knowledge of music theory Absolutely. in actual playing. So, Absolutely. I think that really helps for that. This is, you, uh, know, you, know, you know, I wrote that book, and there was yes. a thing in that book, I, I put in those, those scales, and um, some people. After a while, the book came out, was released, and after a while, they, they they wrote me emails and contacted me and said, "Yeah, it's nice, but you have to write the next step." And I wrote back, "Oh, you trained all those scales in every key?" And they said, "Ah, no, not that one. Uh, but I learned all the tricks. Now you can do a new book." And I said, "Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you like the dressed ape." Yeah, you do some tricks on the bass. Yeah, you can do a fine triple slap, but um, you, you never know what you're doing, really. Some I know some uh, some rockabilly say uh, that's not necessary playing rockabilly, and I say yeah, maybe not, but um, um, it's not a problem to know it. <laughs> it doesn't make your music better. Um, so why not uh, have a harmonical concept and train your ears? And get new ideas while you work with scales and with chords and with arpeggios and all that stuff. And therefore, jazz is a great art. Uh, and beside that, some of those songs are really great songs, nice melodies, nice to play. It's fun. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to say, Blue Bossa is a nice song. <laughs> so why not playing Blue Bossa? <laughs> yeah. A lot of people played it before. I played too. <laughs> 
and uh, absolutely like, i think that i think that those songs are necessary yeah absolutely and, and um those 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 uh uh accords and you know those progressions are kind of the most logical and very def and define the style so mm -hmm. i think it's i think it's uh uh definitely good to know uh next, american songbook or real book whatever you want to call it and the next question most people have is how can i make an own bass line i play always uh the, the root the third the fifth or maybe the sixth or the seventh sorry for my lispling uh, <laughs> i love the english language because of the th and um yeah but um how can i make more interesting bass lines and i say yeah then it's necessary to train the scales and to listen to different kinds of music. If you only like to play root five bass or those very easy bass lines and with very fast slapping style, then everything's cool. But if you like to go further, it would be necessary to check out the scales. It's just Absolutely. And, and, and you also teach, right? Yeah. Yes. Do you teach online or you teach in school or something? Um, Sometimes online, mostly privately. I have uh, two places where I teach, not on school. I, I quit that because um, yeah, in Germany on music schools, you hardly get any money. Um, so uh, it's much better to do it privately. <laughs> and yeah, and yeah, it's for me, there's, if a student's coming, I don't say, so now we have 60 minutes. Um, now you have to go, goodbye. I say, um, I, the students have to leave when I have the feeling that they learned what I wanted them to to be learned, and uh, that's much easier if you do it privately. Um, interesting is that in the Corona situation, more and more people contacted me and asked for some lessons. Maybe now we have some time. Now maybe we can uh, pr make some uh, progression in bass playing. Maybe that's the situation, and um, I'm teaching more actually. That helps me. That's great. Bit. So, oh, if yeah. people want to get in touch with you, like, what is the best way? Facebook, yeah, email. Facebook, email. Yeah, Facebook, Facebook. I think. Uh, yeah, I always got the problem that I have those five thousand friends. <laughs> I, I have to make an artist uh, uh, platform one day. Yeah, but uh, as I mentioned before, always um, there's always so much work to be done. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean you know to show other people and for our own development um yeah. mark's gold also wrote that lee rocker was the first guy he's uh he saw standing on an upright okay yeah. i think that's for that's for many people you know besides maybe um uh al rapa from bill haley's band you know yes. with that famous photo um and let me see uh Oh, Karen wrote that uh, asked you to turn your camera and show your upright bases. Should I? Should I? Uh, yeah, can you? We're gonna talk about him a little bit later, you know, about your yeah. gear and all of yeah, that. Yeah, but you know, and wait, wait, wait. There's some more. Oh wow! And there is the black one I played, and that is lying on the floor. Ah, yeah. okay. How many bases do you have? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think, uh, I don't know it exactly. Um, I think uh, 10 uprights, 10 or 11 uprights. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, about 25 electrics. I have uh, three or four guitars. And uh, I have a very, very ex exotic thing here. It's called a Chapman stick. You ever heard of that? Oh, yeah, of course. I know. 10 string or 12 string playing with. Both. I know, Chapman. You know who plays that? Who started playing that? I mean, like now, maybe 20 10 years ago. The, the guy, yeah, but like um, the guy from the Hillbilly Hellcats, uh, what is his name? Oh. Uh, Chuck? He, he started that. playing that. Yeah, yeah, wow. he started playing cool. that. Yeah. Yeah, cool, cool. That man got a good taste. <laughs> uh, do you play that? Yeah, yeah, try to, try to. This is, uh, it's a fight, and mostly the stick wins. <laughs> yeah, and it's, so what are the, uh, what are the other instruments that you play besides upright bass? Uh, yeah, a little bit guitar, a little bit piano. Yeah, that's it. A little bit drums, uh, but um, 
Um, I used the guitar only for, 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 for writing songs and also the piano. I never learned them perfectly. And yeah, that's it. That's it. I also try to sing, but only oh, for, do you? Okay. Yeah, for, for the demos for the band. I write. Mm -hmm. Indeed, mm. on the last albums of Bob and B, there are really a lot of songs written by me. Not the best ones, maybe, not the singles. But that's not a problem for me. But uh, yeah, I write a lot, really, really a lot. Yeah, there's a, there's a video on YouTube I played uh, an, a, a kind of psychobilly flat bass. That is a song I wrote for the band, and I recognize it's much too fast. It's more, yeah, it's much too much Tiger Army style <laughs> because I was so much into Tiger Army when I uh, recognized that band, and uh, the, the first two or three albums that blew me so much away. The new ones also, but the, the, the point that it's new, it's gone. So now it's great music. And that time that was something like, wow. Yeah, uh, Psycho Billy with me melodies. Wow, cool. <laughs> That's what yeah, I like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tiger Army definitely audience. brought something new to the style, yeah. for sure. We have well, a comment from like Jason. Jason wrote, I really need to start learning how to comp different chord structures with something other than the root notes. Well, it is important, Jason. And then if you follow slap streams, uh, you're going to learn that in no time. Yeah. Um, and uh, we have uh, here uh, somebody from wow. Germany, from Redback Spiders. Yeah, hello. From, I'm, working uh, on a, I'm working on a piece of music. Oli played bass on. They, he oh, wow. Did, yeah, he played bass on a, a version of um, Ace of Spades with uh, his former band Pinstripes, and I like that one. Really, it's it's a nice version. Yeah, and uh, when uh, to, to train my, my right hand, this one is nice, Oli. Thanks yeah, that. it's interesting. I, Ace of Spades is really, really fits well on upright bass. I did it for the slab bass Sunday in front of the rainbow, on the yeah. Sunset Strip, and it's, I think it's one of the more popular slab based Sunday videos. So yeah. it's and interesting. It's, also, it's, the one, it's what? Yeah. That is brilliant. Yours is brilliant too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all those slab based Sunday videos were like, I would just go somewhere, I would be pissed that I had to drive for it hour and hour and a half, and then I would play it once. I would tape actually the the because I would not learn those songs. I would just tape the uh, the chart on the side of the bass and read it and play, it and be done with it. <laughs> so it was interesting. I wish I, I put a little more time into those songs, but I I think they're fine. You know, yeah, it's yeah. it's yeah. I, yeah, it, but it was great. I, I was always watching it. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Like I, I was influenced Thank by you. Yeah, yeah it's, this is, I think, what we all can do if we like to. We listen to other players and we say, yeah, wow, nice one. And um, he does things totally different than me. And he's not bad, he's different. And that's great. And uh, this is why I check out so much songs from different players. All those solos. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I always keep always keep Mill Hinton in my mind because he is... He's the one that said, like, you know, you have to keep your ears open Absolutely. for everyone, you know? So, you know Selma Terry, I think. Selma Terry? Selma Terry and the Playboys? That old, that women out of the 20s or 30s playing slap bass? Okay. You okay. Don't know. Yeah, it's brilliant. I'm wow. not sure. That, 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 I, I cannot hear you the, 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 the name exactly. Maybe, maybe, I do, maybe I don't. Selma Terry. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Selma Terry. Yeah, yeah. She was. Uh, she had the Jim Krupa in uh, playing drums in her band, of course, yeah. from Chicago. Yeah. Uh, she's featured heavily on that the compilation. How low can you go? She was yeah. great. Mm -hmm. Also, and uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, what I wanted to ask you: so, besides Bopping B, who are the other artists that you that you played with? <laughs> Let me explain. As far as, as, as far as slap bass goes, let, let's let's. Yeah, yeah. I know that you played with lots of people, electric, and then. But since this is the slap stream and it's focused on slap, so let's hear uh, bands not, that you had a chance to play slap with. Yeah, hardly. I played hardly with other musicians because uh, 
it's necessary to explain for those who don't know Bob and B that much that we in the in the early years or the the first 15 20 years we played nearly 200 shows every year so it's not really possible and i got beside those 200 shows i got 25 students every week so 200 shows a year 25 students every week there's hardly any time to play with other bands i played with a band called the dirty boogie orchestra which you may imagine play the Brian that's orchestra stuff play the um, Brian that's orchestra stuff and um i play and, with um, i play um, with uh, a local band uh, local band i play with a guy called michael michael uh uh i played hardwood bands, bands. I, I didn't know about um Oops, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know about the Dirty Boogie or So was that a, like a big band style band? Yeah, like the Brian That's an Orchestra thing. Dirty Boogie Orchestra was playing Brian That's an Orchestra songs. And, ah, um, okay. And uh, the, the, there, therefore I played several times and um, yeah, but I hardly have the time to play with other bands because we're doing actually if 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 you can play, we play 160, 107 shows every year. And so you can see there's hardly time to play with other with other bands and beside that to teach and uh to write songs and uh to practice by yourself and uh, have a family. Um yeah, and uh, when I go out running, I do that. Don't do that for thirty minutes. I do that for two or three hours. So, uh, <laughs> where's the time going? <laughs> yeah, but it's great that you're you know active and you're still active and been for a long time. Uh, let's talk a little bit about a bopping bee. So you started that band when you were about nineteen, right? Yeah, nineteen. Around. And, uh, and the band has been going on for about thirty six years now. Uh, and uh, uh, how many albums have you recorded so far? Oh my god, fourteen or fifteen? Fifteen, I think. Fifteen. Oh, okay. O officially, it, officially, is that the longest running rockabilly band in Germany? Uh, no, there is one more band, exactly, maybe exactly the same time, the Rockabilly Mafia. Oh, I heard about that band. Okay. Yeah, also an interesting, nice guy playing the bass. <laughs> and um, they play, to, but they don't play that much shows as we do for all that time. They play okay. several shows a year. They have not that much CDs. That's not a, not a point of quality, but, the, but they are still together for always 35 years. And, uh, and with Bob and B, you had a decent commercial success, right? Especially yes. for a rockabilly band, right? Yes, yes. It, it's kind of hard to see. I mean, you know, since I never lived in Germany, but, you know, whenever I see those shows, like they seem like pretty big, you know, for a rockabilly band, which is which is great. Uh, what was the point that brought rockabilly back to Germany and then did you guys succeed, like to incorporate it and then being successful on your own? Yeah, the, the point was that those famous German pop singer, Sasha, uh, uh, decided to make a one year break as a pop singer and uh, and he just wanted to have a fun band and he asked his guitar player of his pop band and that was a guy uh, was digging very much into uh, rock billy called Andre Tolba and um, they decided to make a rock billy uh, just for fun just playing some concerts and uh, and um, but uh, the record company uh, heard that one and they said let's make an album they brought it out and it was the best-selling album the record company had at that year and the best-selling album sasha ever had they sold over five hundred thousand copies which was very much for germany at that time and uh but sasha said i want to go back to be a pop singer and not that much into rockabilly and uh, the record company was looking for another band. And uh, the, the funny point was that uh, we were playing for 20 years and had only small success. And we decided to um, to do some Sasha songs as Rockabilly as a kind of reaction. If Sasha is going to do what we, what we like to do, we 
like to do what he's normally doing. So a record company uh, heard that one and decided to make an album with us only with Sasha songs. For me, it's not the biggest idea, but uh, mm. to be true, that was our best-selling album. And because okay, of I didn't know that. You're, oh, that's interesting. So, if you believe it's it's uh, from that album, yeah. And do you know the original version of "If You Believe"? I, I do, I do. Yeah, it's it's a Sasha's very mellow, very pop, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> believe me, when when they sent me the songs to check them out, I was sitting there, fifteen songs from Sasha listening to them that what the fuck are we gonna do how can we make rock and roll out of that this is a real bunch of work to make to put some rock and roll in that stuff i think we did it not bad <laughs> yeah. you know i heard uh, i heard only if you believe and yeah. i think you guys did a great job you know so so, so basically, Sasha, uh, the uh, people that are not familiar, that's uh, Dick Brave and the Backbeats, the band. Um, because I don't think that many people outside of Germany are familiar with that band. Uh, yeah. So, so that's kind of what brought help you, you guys out, like to play bigger stages and everything. Yeah, yeah. But uh, on the other side. We, when we started with the band Bob and B, there was one point in Germany that was a bit difficult. Um, we're not originally out of the rockabilly scene, especially me. I was the guy with the long hair and I put them together as a, sorry, I missed the English word, a top. And I got a, 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 the hair made, but um, they didn't like it because it was not original enough. And uh, so we decided if the rockabillies don't like us, we don't play where the people like us. And we played on normal festivals, punk festivals, rock festivals, punk clubs, rock clubs, live clubs, everywhere. And, uh, and we did it for the, just for the fun of it. We never thought about making much money out of it, making a living out of it. And we did it for the fun. We were five friends hanging out it's like um yeah and every time having a big party after the show or maybe while the show and sometimes before the show yeah that's what we did and um the rockable scene always said yeah they are not original they are not they not do not belong to us and um so um so we had a lot of big concerts before that success because we made ourselves a name in the in the in the rock scene we, we played on big festivals because we were the funny guys playing a kind of rockabilly mix and uh, yeah, with a punk attitude maybe. And uh, a, a little bit like the Stray Cats started out in 83. That was not an idea we had, that was just happening. Um, when, the, when that success came with that album, uh, it got more, more bigger, that's true. But uh, as you may know, um, you have one album in the charts and the sec next one is not in the charts and then uh, you have to stand on your own feet again. And that's what we do. And for us, it was great that our actual album, Take Care of Your Hair, which we released last year, went into the German Top 100 charts, to be true, only for one week. All right, congratulations. Yeah, and we did it only with our own work, no record company nothing it was just basically grassroots working and this is all right we're really, we're really proud of it because this is uh, you work 35 years to be uh <laughs> top 100 for one week yeah <laughs> i think it's funny a bit but why not <laughs> sure i mean the top charts are a joke anyway so it doesn't matter it's you a know. great success you know when you hear the about rockabilly bands um uh making it Coffin Bay 666 uh, has a question about Red Velvet Trio, and then he said they're playing for a while. Um, I'm not sure. Are they playing as long as you guys are, or no? Okay. I think. Um, and how about like I noticed there's a there's a, another band that I think that they came out kind of like with that whole Sasha Dick Brave thing. Uh, the Baseballs they came out out of that whole scene as well, right? Yeah, they, they are, one of the guys in the band is originally from the scene, it's the big singer, and um, the Sam, Sam is his name, and, uh, but the other, they are a casted band, 
the record company and the band itself say, no, we are not casted, but this is the story every casted band is telling all the time. We are not casted, we are friends, blah, 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 blah. And, um, but uh, they are uh, really successful. And they bring still? out, yeah, not that much as in the beginning, but um, yeah, they're still working, yeah. And uh, to be true, they are kind people. We meet them sometimes on concerts, playing together shows, and uh, yeah, nothing wrong with them. Uh, I think there are several bands, you know, I think you sure know the Boss Hoss. Yes. Yes. This is a band, the, the, the guitar player, one of those. Hot Boogie Chillin, right? Yes. And this guy originally came out of the original rockabilly scene. And when Boss Hoss started, the whole rockabilly scene that this is original, now it's good. Bob and B is not original, now it's bad. So um, that was funny for us, but uh, all, the same thing with the baseballs. Bosshaus are really kind people. We meet them on festivals. I'm really friend with the bass player, and um, we're really looking forward to meet them and have some drinks. And uh, um, that for me, I'm, I'm not. Uh, if somebody has success, I'm really lucky because, uh, in my opinion, my success is big enough. Uh, I can make a living out of music. I can play music all day long. That is a real gift. So why should I be um, look bad on other people and say, they, they don't deserve it? No, that's not my way of thinking. Um, bosses are, um, yeah, Walk This Way video was really stunning. And um, they are really kind of people, so everything's cool with bosses and with baseballs for us. And there are several other bands in Europe, like, the top cats from Sweden, uh, and yeah, maybe you know them too. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. The top cats from Sweden. Yes, I'm not sure if I'm familiar with them. Oh, also nice band, and they got the, the first single uh, or the first single on with a big company. They brought out was Biska. Say they took part in a show like a uh, uh, most famous singer you have at them in america too and um, they took part there and um, a, a swedish superstar or something like that and they won it and they were very successful nowadays it's getting harder for them i think it's the same thing with all these bands the success the big su success is gone now you have to stand on your own feet. Uh, the venues are getting smaller. The backstage is getting colder. The beer is getting warmer again. Yeah, like that. So, but Top Cat's also a nice and interesting band. Yeah. So, yeah. I'll check them out. Um, do they have slab bass? Yes. Yes. All right. Yeah. That's a big plus. <laughs> um, <laughs> My man. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here. That's why I created the slap stream. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what would you say was the biggest success for you personally as a as a bass player and uh, for the Bop and B as a band? Oh, yeah. Too difficult. <laughs> okay. Um, I try. Um, I think for me personally and also for the band, the thing is that after 35 years of hard, really hard working, sorry to say, that way it was really hard work. We never saw it as hard work, but it was hard work. Uh, I see, I think we get respect, really respect for that hard work. And we can do, we can say we like to be Bob and B, we don't like to be the the, the Bill Haley cover band or the the, uh, the Rock and Billy Stray Cats cover band. Or so we are Bob and B as we are, and I'm Diddy Beck as I am. And uh, I get respect for that. And this, for me, this is the biggest thing. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Great. I can be myself and nobody's really laughing. <laughs> Uh, how many albums have you recorded outside of a Bop and B? Not that much as you may be, but um, oh, I, I, I never counted them. Really, never counted them. I have a studio here, not that bad, um, with nice microphones, nice preamps and so on. And uh, yeah, and um, I do, uh, the people call me and I said, Send me the send me the, uh, the the tracks and I make the recording. I send you back, and um, yeah, uh, several albums, mostly rock or sometimes rockabilly style and uh, 
playing electric, playing fretless bass, playing pizzicato upright bass. Yeah, it's easy for the people. They co contact me. They send me the tracks. Easy going. Easy going. They don't. All have right. So if anyone, I mean, this is mostly bass audience, so I doubt you're gonna get too many customers yeah. like do, <laughs> requesting that. But if some of the bopping bees fans are checking out this, like they can get in touch with you through Facebook or Instagram, and then you're available for some studio work, right? Yeah, yeah, and uh, just if we, if we talk about that kind of topic, uh, if you want a transcription from a song, call me. I try. Oh, wow, so you're you're good with that too? Yes, yes. And All right. So this is one thing. This is one thing I, I like to do is the new book. I always think about it. Uh, the most players I know are looking for great bass playing. On, on different albums and I have a lot of transcriptions of, as I think, great players. And um, I like to do a book with those, like the 20 Hot Rockabilly or Slap Bass Lakes. And um, the problem mostly is if it's a player I know personally, I can call him and can say, is that okay for you? Ask your, ask your um, company if it's okay. I can't pay much money because uh, making a book you don't earn that much money as most people think from my book that is really very well sold uh we sold about 3500 copies and i get uh, two or three euros from every copy so and that took me over one and a half year work that book so think about what i get every hour i work on a book like that so um i can't pay about thousand dollars for for making um a transcription of a, of a Stray Cat solo. That is not possible for me. So, but personally, if you ask me and say, ah, oh, yeah, uh, I like to have that Stray Cat solo, that's not the problem. This is kind of my uh, teaching work. And uh, for me, it's fun. I really like that. It. That's great. Uh, I know that I, I encountered that problem when I started writing uh, my slide based book like a long time ago. And then I wanted to feature some solos. And then I transcribed a bunch and then I figured out, wait a second, I can't do anything with these, you know, because you're not allowed to publish that. Even those are just bass solos, but it is what it is, especially if the songs are on the record. So uh, uh, on the record with a label. So then it's even, even harder. Uh, yeah. Mark's Gold wrote, Didi, you are such a likable person and musician. <laughs> and Casey wrote, awesome. Uh, Didi, you have definitely earned respect. So, yeah, thanks people, so much. That keeps people, me going. Yeah, people love you here in Slapsville, you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hope so. Yeah. Hope so. Yeah. This is what we come here, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really yeah. enjoyed to talk about music and uh, slap bass playing with such a maniac like you, George. It's like, yeah. uh, <laughs> you see. If you if you walk around and uh, you say yeah I'm a slap bass player and the other musicians say yeah yeah nice 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 okay, yeah yeah so, uh, take search for some for someone like yourself and yeah I like to talk about strings and uh, techniques and uh, pickups and basses and all the other people say oh my god and uh, <laughs> this is um it's nice to have someone like you. <laughs> <laughs> We should be neighbors, maybe <laughs> hanging out with a beer or something like that, and talk about all that stuff. <laughs> yes, one of these days I'm going to start Slapsville as real city, and then like bring all the guests from the Slapstream to live in the, yeah, in nice the town. Idea. Very nice idea. Yeah. So we could just listen. Else, all we're all going to be go 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 crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Completely crazy. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder, like, uh, since you play, you told me you play lots of shows, you play on lots of records. Uh, what would you say? Does your playing, is your playing different on when you have to do studio work or when you have to play live? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. To it's be, different. How? 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 Um, um, <laughs> uh, live, it's, it's, uh, you play it and it's gone. So you try much more. And uh, in the studio, uh, it depends on the situation. If you're in a studio that's that's rent and yeah, the, the the clock is running, then uh, you you do it for safety because that's the the next thing. Um, they work for days and days on the drum track. For the guitar, they work more days. 
And then finally the singer is coming and they work weeks. And if it's up to the upright bass, ah, oh, yeah, um, it's nine o'clock in the morning at three, my wife's waiting for me. I think you fit the whole album in that time. Is that right? Yeah, you can do that. Is that okay? Yeah, fine. That's the way it goes every time in the studio. And I hate it. This is the reason why I have my own studio and I say, come on guys, send me the tracks and I do it by myself. So uh, since I have that studio, it's much more easier for me. I like it very much. But to be true, life is more energy. Yeah, and uh, playing with with a, with a headphone, I don't like it that much. Um, you miss the low end all the time. The hearing is not that the same. I think my problem is I play such a lot of live shows. I'm so much used to playing live shows, much more than playing in studio, that it, I miss the live situation in studio. So, um, yeah. This is for the... Yeah. I don't know how it is with you. you. You do the same thing. You practice a lot. I don't practice a lot. You know, I really don't. And um, You don't have to, maybe. <laughs> I don't. You know, when I was at the conservatory, I was practicing every, every day, like for five, six hours. But it was mostly playing with the bow. You know, I would play, you know, a lot open strings for an hour, scales for an hour, etudes for an hour. And then I would play... Uh, whatever concertos or sonatas that I had to play. So that was kind of my practice regime that I was following. And that would, and then I would be excited to play slap. So I, I would be playing slap whenever I wanted to rest. So I didn't count that for those like five hours. It was five hours of playing with the bow, classical stuff. And then jazz and rockabilly or whatever else, it was always on the side. So yeah. I was always thinking about classical music school as the way to learn to play bass. And yeah. then I, I always wanted to apply that knowledge in the different styles that I wanted to play more. Yeah. I did play in a symphony orchestra for seven years, but I was, I always enjoyed more playing in a small bands. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's, it's just different. I mean, yeah, I, it's, do you, um, you prefer studio or live? I like it both, you know, uh, and it's interesting that what you mentioned, because when you play live, once you do it, it's gone. That's true. But like for, for me, like for some certain bands that I play with, um, I kind of play 80% of the time kind of the same live. Okay. And then, you know, and then are, there are other bands that I play 100% of the time I play different. I'm, I'm, I have a freedom to, to completely, you know, experiment all the time. Yes. So it's, it's different. And then what you said, it's true. You know, once you play live, it's gone. So if you didn't play the exact same line for those bands that you have to play the exact same line, it's gone, then basically you screwed up. And uh, and with the other situation, when you're allowed to and when you're free to play um, more open and more experimental, um, it's once you do that, it's uh, uh, you kind of like forget it, you know, like you don't know if it's was it good? Was it bad? You know, like because you're playing something different all the time so it's yeah. tricky but i but i love playing in uh, recording in studios i love when people hire me uh especially if they bring a chart they say like hey this is the chart so you have a freedom to play here your own bass lines or um i have these exact lines that i it's, it's a, it, especially if they're ready it's, it could be very pleasant so i can be just focused on creating music if they write me the bass lines if they say like you know this is the 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 part that where I want you to create a baseline. This is the exact baseline that you wanted. This is something that I'm experimenting. Whatever you know, so they give me more guidelines, and I go in the studio and do it. I love it. I'm not yeah. that crazy about recording by myself, but but that works too. You know, so okay, okay, yeah, yes. Yeah, so it's um, so it's interesting. I'm working right now on on an album with Bernie Dressel. Do you know Bernie Dressel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian, Set Brian, Brian Setzer's drummer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Brilliant. we're working. 
It's Excellent great. drummer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of my favorites. And we are working on a big band record, and it's a jazz record. And it's very challenging for uh for um uh to to sight read because lots of lines are written down and it's fast and it's you know even some lots of um uh walking bass lines are composed uh so the arranger wrote that so that it fits the horns and everything so it's it's tricky like with those tempos like to read that and i really enjoy it because it's challenging it's not just like hey whatever, you know, I just show up and record, you know, 10 songs. No, I record three or four songs. And then it's, uh, takes an hour, you know, or like, you know, 45 minutes per song to find yeah. sound. And then, you know, then you're not able to play like from, you know, from the first sight read takes like, a couple of times, but it's, but it's, but it's great because it kind of makes you, makes your, um, uh, brain work a little bit more. Yeah. This is something. Um, Hey, you're right. This is this is kind of musical work. Uh, this is the kind of part on, on music I really enjoy. Also, if 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 it keeps you awakening and it, yeah, bra the brain working, and this is something I, that is fun for me too. This is uh, yeah, this is the part I like. Yeah, but I do yeah. On, stage, on stage too. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, I I see myself more of a performer than a studio. I mean, I don't know, but. It, I probably like it the most, but equal, you know, to be a studio guy and and a performer. I don't know. It's it's I write writing music too as well. Um, uh, do you uh, do you read music? Uh, not perfect, but I can read. Yes. And so when you transpose, or when you uh, transcribe, sorry, uh, do you write it down in notes or how do you write it down? Uh, in notes, I have, I have a, 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 a it's called final. It's a program final where you write it down, so you can bring it directly to, in a book form if you like to. Final notation. This okay. Is, yeah, but it, I'm, I write it down in in notes. Yes. Do do you have a, like a special way like to write down uh, slaps? Yeah, this is something we just discussed that, uh, you know, maybe you remembered when uh, about the drag slab and so on. And uh, this is very difficult because I think um, the exact rhythmical, uh, to write it down very exact rhythmically is very, very difficult because um, there is also a kind of feel you, you need to have if, It's a it's a shuffle feel. It's a binary feel, and um, then you do, a, for example, a drag or a, or a quadruple. Then then it's really hard to write it down. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm always thinking about how to do it. That no one is coming. That you can't do that. Because uh, you, I always love that point in books when they write down walking bass lines and uh, at, at the beginning they write uh, swing feel. And you know, yeah, <laughs> the easy way. I mean, that's the, that's the only way how you can do it. Otherwise, you know, that depends on, on, a, on a BPM and a tempo. I mean, so you can't really, that's the only way how you can do it, you know, with the swing feel. And I'm glad you mentioned drag slap or roll slap or whatever you want to call it, uh, because that's one figure that you can't uh, write down very precisely because it also depends. Uh, actually, it's not connected to the tempo, so it always sounds the same. So if you play slow or, or, or fast, it's kind of always the same. So it's I always uh, seen that figure as an ornament more than than exact uh uh rhythmical figure yeah but i spent I, i spent a lots of time uh you know uh uh analyzing and then you know figuring out how things should be written there is, down um yeah, there is one song that is for me a very special song where, where the drag slap is very popular and that is um uh, slow down baby from high noon oh, yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. that's the one that i always uh choose as an example because it's part of the arrangement and yeah. it's if i believe he plays it on two which is cool because it's not um uh, it's not kind of intro introduction to one if i remember correctly i think it's always the yes, uh, always on two i have it here written down uh, oh cool 
All right. Uh, this is the way I try. I, um, I recorded it by myself and make it very slow and then uh, checked it out with the time and so on. I put a lot of work in it because I really love the song. I really love Kevin's style very much. And um, he's an absolutely brilliant player. And that video, the Ungentle Art of Slap Bass playing, uh, showed me a new world of uh, playing bass. When Before that, um, uh, I was playing just the simple slap bass styles, some triplets, fast triplets, and that's it. And when I saw Kevin playing on that video, I was like, wow, this is what I want to learn now. And uh, the, the, that uh, drag slap, uh, all the time I check him out, I put a lot of work in that because um, you learn a lot by his playing. And um, yeah, but it's like you say, um, if you're playing a bit faster, then it's like ornament. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yes, once once you start, yeah, we can discuss like this uh, nomenclature and and uh, and you know how to write it down like all of that like you know even offline when you know when <laughs> when we both have time. Um, <laughs> Marks uh, Marks asked me. I'm reassured to hear that this is also a challenge for you. It is, you know, uh, uh, sight reading could be a challenge. Um, it's usually not, I mean, 90% of the time, like when people bring me uh, charts or like notes, I'm able to sight read it, you know, from the first time. But if it's something that it's, you know, over 200 BPMs or if it's some like a com contemporary classical approach, then then can take you know a couple of minutes you know to figure it out but that's something that you always have to work on so it's yes. it's uh it's not yeah it's i mean i have 14 years of classical music school so that uh, my mind is programmed like to read that but it's uh, but it's you know i don't do it that much these days yeah. so um it's like it's like if you're reading a book for example, you, when you're a small child, you don't know nothing about those those things, and you learn it one day, and one day you read a book, and it's totally normal. And reading, no, uh, side reading, is the same way. You have to practice it, and the more you practice it, the better you get. Yes, for me, it was really great uh, uh, doing uh, symphony orchestra stuff because it was always something new, or chamber orchestra. It was always something new. And then you have to read it, you know, from the first time, maybe a little slower when you were a kid, but then, you know, they want to work on music. They don't want to work on your reading skills. So you have to be are you, are efficient. You doing, are you still playing in, uh, in those orchestras? No, I played for, I played for seven years. Uh, I stopped when I was maybe 24, five or something. Okay. Started yeah. playing symphony orchestra when I was, I don't know, 17, 18, something like that. Yeah. And before I moved to the States, I moved to the States when I was 26. So before that, I already, yeah, something like that, 17 to 24. I don't know. I never calculated that, but yeah, something like that. When I was start heavily studying classical music, that's when I was doing that. Yeah. Well, which was great because you always had a few rehearsals per, per week and I was playing lots of jazz in those days as well. So it was, I had both of those at a, at a kind of like same time. Yeah. Best training. Um, Absolutely. Best yeah, training. It, yeah. You know, um, I, I can't say, you know, really, because for me, it was really worth it, you know, but I also see people that, you know, classical music, or even jazz music is structured them like a lot. They're not able to kind of see things outside of it. So they kind of get stuck in a, in a certain style. And for me, music is freedom. Music kind of frees me and it, it opens my mind and my heart and everything. So, uh, so for me, it was important to be uh, wide open to understand everything and, and to play everything, to try everything, to taste everything. So that was that was that was kind of my thing. But for some people, it's not really the best thing to do because it kind of structured them, and then they yeah. don't know how to get out of that. And then you know, if if they're excellent in a particular style, that's not too big of a problem. But if they're 
kind of okay, then it's then it's a problem because you have all that knowledge, like like music theory knowledge. Like I mean, that's like for classical people, they have like amazing knowledge, but they they, they can never use it. They can use it like to analyze <laughs> Wagner, you know, like opera or something, and then you write down under like everything, which is great. But if you can't use that in your playing or in your composing then it's kind of almost useless for me it was important to understand music kind of like this and why these things yeah. kind of function the same way and you know to understand why is circle of fifths with rock world like one way and then with the jazz world is is a different way with classical world is different you know the other way and then if you if you listening to to uh, uh traditional musicians like like they the do like folk songs it's it's all these songs are a little bit higher or low or notes are a little bit higher or lower and so anyway so i don't want to get too much into that world it, it, you know, I, I can talk about all of that you know for hours but it's yeah yeah that's not the topic that the topic is slab bass so yeah i want to hear you play is, is your bass close by yeah yeah so I let's let's played. let's what you gonna play now oh let me think let me think um you see i always check out i, I know a lot of a lot of things about joe tink and i can play one more joe tink or um no i play a diddy back the one i did for rockabilly for other flat bass some uh, years ago and um i tell you the truth the intro of that song is influenced by one of the bass players I by one of the bass players I very much, which is less clay from Charles. And uh, maybe some of you maybe some of you from too many And how did you call? You called that song uh, um, "Funky Something." Funky style boogie. I yeah, yeah, was, something like that. Yeah, okay, okay. That was the one I choose. <laughs> you asked me for something, and at that point, I never had an idea of playing a song alone at the flat bass. And then I saw, um, nice, a nice idea. So, <laughs> have an idea now and then, and um, yeah, and uh, then I put that piece together and, um, and of course it's a blues a blues scheme and um, and the intro and but there's one point in my playing I know uh, that I'm really influenced also by black music and not only blues and and, and, and swing and that one when I was very young I listened a lot to soul and funk music my brother was a big funk fan and he always played that funk uh, song very loud, James Brown, Motown things, and so on. And uh, I really loved that group. So I think um, 
all my playing is a bit influenced by it. And one of the players, of the slap players, I really like most is uh, Willie Dixon. That's his. Oh, yeah, absolutely. One of my biggest heroes. He's so cool. And nobody talked about funk at the time he was playing, but he was more funky than most of the funk players ever. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, how did, I wonder, how did you discover Willie Dixon? Uh, by Muddy Waters. I listened to. Oh, Money. really? Okay. Uh, I can't be satisfied with the song. I, I, I always remember those special songs, and I thought, "Hi, oh, playing a great bass line." And uh, I went to the internet and checked it out. And um, I don't. Yeah, it was at the early days of the internet, and uh, but I got the information Willie Dixon, and then I was going to record stores, and there were, were different blues albums where Willie Dixon was playing bass. And later words, older musicians, blues musicians told me stories about Willie Dixon, that he was the main songwriter for a lot of blues musicians and uh, played um, upright bass for Chuck Berry, for example. Um, there's one song that is also a key song for me. It's uh, You Can't Catch Me from uh, Chuck Berry. It's a... And I heard that one. I said, wow, Willie Dixon, what are you doing the hell? And uh, checked it out. And um, yeah, I tried to get as much as possible from Willie Dixon because um, yeah, he's great, simply great. Yeah, there are so many great players, but he's a little bit greater, maybe. <laughs> yeah, Willie Dixon is definitely one of the favorites. Uh, I I have to uh, just say something. Uh, the song that you mentioned, I can't be satisfied with uh, uh, by Muddy Waters. That's not Willie Dixon. Oh. But, those old blues guys lying to me. <laughs> that's, Ernest, that, that's Ernest B. Crawford. As you know, I believe you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but maybe. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, that yeah. song with slap and everything. It's you know, it's a it's it's great song. I can be satisfied, yeah. and I I remember hearing it for the first time. When I was a kid, and and then I loved it, and it's um, I was really into blues at that time, and um, and Ernest Big Crawford wrote that, so oh, not okay. wrote, I mean played played bass on that one. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That still that guy that told me that one is is not alive anymore. anymore so. <laughs> you can't tell him. Um, so were you influenced by blues as well? Yes, yes. We had a lot of uh, American GIs in my hometown, and they were playing in a club, in a small club, and mostly blues. And um, there I saw the first slap bass player live, rock a bit, also, uh, upright slap bass player live. That wasn't uh, a Chicago-style blues band called the Hoochie Coochie Blues Band. They were famous in our area, and uh, that guy came from a rockabilly band that also was famous in the area, they, they called themselves Rollsplit, and his name was Harald Oberhell. And um, after the show, I went to him and I said, hey, Harald, wow, that's great. You're the first live slap bass player I ever saw. Can you give me some information? And he said, mm, no, I think you have to check it out by yourself. Goodbye. Uh -huh. And uh, that was the point when I decided, if I ever know something that somebody wants to learn, I will try to show him. <laughs> and that asshole yeah. <laughs> is responsible for it. <laughs> I, I, really, I really thought that was not nice. Um, sure. <laughs> you know, but everybody, yeah, I give everyone, you know, a chance to, to have a bad day. You know, you never know what's happening in guy's life. It's so weird. But it's great that you are sharing your knowledge as much as you can. You wrote a book. You published the instructional DVD. Instructional DVD is just in uh, in German, right? Only in German. Sorry for that. We, Only we in German. About, yeah, we thought about doing that again, but uh, in, in times of YouTube, the world doesn't need it. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. There's a, that's that's a, a format that it's kind of historical format. Yeah. I mean, even books are kind of like hard like to do, but, uh, and whoever is interested in a book, you know, by D.D. Beck, it's called Rockabilly Slab, Slab Bass by D.D. Beck. And it's available on Art of Slab Bass website. Just go to artofslabbass.com. Yeah. Um, this one. 
<laughs> you know, I'm actually kind of stoked, you know, like that I figured out that 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 name, you know, when I was, you know, when I was starting out, it's like, you know, how I'm going to call this website. I really want to do this. I really want to make it happen. At first, I wanted to do it as a part of rockabillybase.com because it was it was yeah. it already had the audience. And then I was people didn't know me. And um and then, you know, I had like, we had some talk and then I didn't agree what they offered. And I was like, ah, you know what, you know, I'm going to do it by myself. Yeah. So, so okay. it's, um, and, and so, yeah, and Rockabilly Base is gone now, you know, so it's, it's, you know, Art of Slut Base is yeah. still here. And you did right because the, what, what you're saying with the Art of Slut Base is totally right. When I, when I, oops. <laughs> wrong, wrong side. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think um, some years ago I had a long discussion with, with, an, uh, with a painter, with an artist, uh, painter, um, and uh, I thought we were talking about what is art and what not, and if, if, if I be an artist or not, and so on. And he said, there is nothing, and you create a sound, and therefore, in my eyes, and in my, especially in my ears, you're an artist. You 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 create something new that wasn't there before. And playing mm -hmm. slap bass is the same thing. You create something that wasn't there before. And especially with with the the new generations of slap bass players, there is so much great good new players that. I think we can say this is an art form in itself, and so it's the right name for uh, for a website and uh, for for all that for YouTube, and so to say it's the art of slap bass, so it fits perfectly. Of course, <laughs> great, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. that. Well, I'm I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad. Um, I'm glad you like it, and then you know I I wanted to make also something that it's more broad uh than just rockabilly you know I, you know and so rockabilly is an art for itself but um slap bass playing don't has to be rockabilly it can exactly. be exactly yeah it's there's some um, so many players like um oh, and I always forget all the names when i'm in an interview but let's say Jimmy Sutton. Yeah, also another great player for me. And uh, Jimmy is not only a rockabilly, he's, um, he's a great musician, not a great rockabilly musician. He's an artist, yeah, playing perfectly flat bass, in my opinion. On the other side, you have players like Kim or you playing uh, most, actually mostly in a, in a psychobilly style, but very rich virtuous um, and that's uh, yeah also an art form so it's not only rockabilly slap bass playing is not only rockabilly and some people sometimes forget it it's a bit of pity but um yeah we work on that <laughs> playing absolutely so that that's the only way you know like to show and everything um i want to be focused more on bass now i mean we were focused yeah. on bass a lot but now even more uh who are your biggest bass influences most specifically slab bass influences yeah as i mentioned before willie dixon uh jimmy sutton kevin smith uh, lee rocker of course mm -hmm. and uh marshall marshall light little -ish. i don't get the right name it's uh always difficult and um yeah, the bass player from Bill Haley. And uh, Jody Mars, he played with Jody Mars. Uh, I really loved him very much. And um, these are, um, and there are so much, uh, that guy from, that one guy, you had it in the in the, uh, in the the show, uh, that one guy, that was a big influence when I recognized his band, uh, The Fabulous Hedgehogs. They, I think they released two albums and uh, maybe I'm the one guy in Germany that bought one of these albums. <laughs> and uh, I really loved his style. That was so crazy. And um, nowadays he's, yeah, he's called that one guy. I, I, I don't know, remember his real name. I think it's Zimmermann or something like that. Yeah. Mike. Mike. Mike, yeah. And uh, he's such a funny person, I think. <laughs> Crazy. Have you seen his radio shows? <laughs> he's doing. <laughs> oh my god! I really always. And, and did you did you know him before the before the slapstream? Mm, yeah, yeah. Because of oh, that. Okay. 
from that Fabulous Hedgehog albums. You know the Fabulous Ah, album? okay. Yeah, 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 I do. Yeah. And um, there are so many players. When I, Nicolas Dubouché, also a great player, mentionable player. I saw on, uh, on Art of Flat Base, I saw a video by Ryan Gould. I checked that one out note by note because I thought, wow, this is really very, very good. And um, yeah, the, you, those are guys that influenced me and these are great players for me. But I'm sure I forgot some, really. <laughs> Sorry for all I forgot. <laughs> I, you kind of answered my question as well. I was I was thinking like more that you're gonna talk about old players, and then I wanted to ask you about nowadays oh. players that you like the most. But you kind of answered from the old players, from the old players. It's Willie Dixon. Uh, it's of course um, that that uh, that Bill Haley player, Marshall Little or Light. These are Lytle, most- Marshall Lytle. Lyle, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm sure I'll forget it next week, <laughs> but then I call you. Um, yeah, but uh, his work was great for me, and uh, uh, and I don't know the players that played with Louis Jordan. When I was young, uh, I also listened a lot to Louis Jordan and uh, liked those players very much. These are main influences. Uh, I got into Joe Cinkano only about six or seven years ago, so uh, I can't call him an influence in that way. The old influences are, and Lee Rocker, maybe. Is that an old influence? I don't know. 83, maybe it's oldie. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's the 80s, you know, whoever you feel like it, you know. Um, the 80s are old, yeah. old music <laughs> nowadays. We're getting old. <laughs> Yeah, Lee, Lee is great. I love Lee. Um, and you told me that the people that you that, that you uh, appreciate now, um, as far as styles go, music styles go. Besides rockabilly, what would you say are the the styles that you're listening the most? The most that what well, changes from every year, or some sometimes it changes from week to week. Good. Uh, the style I prefer is great music. And uh, as far as the yeah. styles that Im- influence your playing, let's do that. Yeah, funk and soul, of course. Uh, listen to that and blues, blues. And um, yeah, when I was young, uh, when I got the long hair and was playing the electric bass, we did a lot of. Uh, on the one side, I played in hard rock and early metal bands and on the other side in, in jazz funk bands uh, influenced by bands like Yellow Jackets or Level 42. Uh, these are influences in my playing also because that and I listen to uh, fretless bass players like Pino Palladino from uh, Paul Young and um, uh, the guy from uh, Talk Talk. Um, how is it called? Oh, forgot him. Um, he's a friend, yeah. And these are influences in my playing. And there is a, a German upright player I really listened a lot to, uh, Eberhard Weber. Eberhard Weber, maybe you heard the name. It's a jazz player. And this is also music I listen to, uh, kind of modern jazz, like, uh, yeah, Espion Svensson Trio and um, Buke Wesseltoft, Gründen, yeah. That, that Scandinavian style of modern jazz. Yeah. Oh, interesting. interesting. Huh. And I know there are a lot of rockabillies out there, but okay, I'll be true. I listen to hip hop. I really listen like, to hip hop. Sure, like, like what? Like what kind of hip hop? Uh, mostly German uh, hip hop, because I think it's very necessary that you get very deep into the lyrics. And I don't like gangster style hip hop, that, that uh, big bitches and the, uh, that, that is not the kind I like. Uh, for me, it's more uh, they got great lyrics and great um, and uh, great grooves. And uh, therefore, we have in uh, in Germany a guy called Torch uh, with a band called Advanced Chemistry. Great lyrics. And uh, um, there, there are different other bands with great lyrics like um, Dendemann and and so on. And on the on the on the on the English side or the American side, for me, I, I have to say, I really think Eminem is a great artist. Yeah, 
yeah, why not? <laughs> he's cool. Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, his lyrics are uh, very well crafted. Um, I mean, it's definitely an art form when he performs it. Um, yeah. That's it. That's it. Uh, how, what would you say? How how did you develop your own style of playing? Ooh, uh, do I have one? Tell me. I don't know. Uh, for me, it's always my style is listening to the song and to make the best out of it. That the the point is, it's not about a, a furious baseline. Uh, it's uh, there is a song, there's melody, there's a feel in the song, there are lyrics, the whole thing together. The bass is the thing to, to support it and to keep it together. And if it's necessary to do that, and it's necessary to do that to play a furious bass line, then it's, yeah, that, then it's, uh, then play a furious bass line. Or I like to do it, but um, uh, the, my style is supporting a song. This is the way I like to go. Influenced by those, that's musicians. absolutely absolutely the, the the most important. And um, since you played like with with more uh, uh, more bands than just Bop and B, who is kind of strictly slap bass style band, um, did you ever experience like band leaders telling you, "Hey, can you play a little less slap now, or a little little? little can you play more slap or stuff like that, or?" They usually let you do whatever you think it's the most appropriate. Um, when I was younger, I mean, about eighty or twenty years old, they, sometimes I played in bands with band leaders. They liked to tell me what to do, and I said, "You see," to the band leader, I told, um, uh, "I said, um, I make music for just for the fun of it, and if you tell me what I have to play." And it's great, I will play it, no problem. But if I don't like it, it's no fun. So why should I play it? Or other possibility, you pay me. Then I play whatever you want. Yeah. But mostly uh, we came to the point that they say, play whatever you want. I think it's the way I, I act in a band. Um, I say, I want to be taken serious and um, so I can take other people serious. I love to give respect, but I need respect. and. Uh, those easy things between people. And uh, nowadays, um, most people call me uh, for playing slap bass because they say, yeah, I know you, 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 you can play that, so why not doing it? But uh, yeah, I, I listen to the song and if there is no slap bass playing needed, I, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, that's the way I handle it. Do you have any advice like for uh, younger people or like other fellow bass players, how to get the gig. It seems that in every country there's one or two or three options at the most, you know, that are like really a successful gig. And then it seems that in Germany that would be, um, that would be Bob and B. And at the time, it was Dick Brave or Baseballs or Boss Hoss, but it was always few gigs, not not that many. So, yeah. what what should musicians, I mean, fellow bass players, do to get? Um, should that be a goal, or should that something else be the goal? What, what I, I, I wonder what 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 are your thoughts about it? Well, yeah, that's that's a really, really the most difficult question you asked me today. Um, uh, should that be a goal? The, the, the question behind your question is: Should it be a goal to become a musician? Uh, and uh, that's what I hear. And uh, this is very difficult to answer, especially in the moment, because uh, nowadays I would say no, it's not the best idea. But the, the point is. Um, what are you going like to do in your life? Do you want to earn a lot of money? Do you want to have a big car? Do you want a big house or things like that? Then don't try to be a musician. This is the wrongest way to, <laughs> to, to, to reach those things. But uh, if you love music and uh, you want to do music, then uh, do everything you can do. Practice as hard as you can. And if somebody asks you, uh, for for a cheap gig uh, and you have to travel a long way and but you got the feeling that it may help you and it may be fun then do it and that that was the way i always went and never asked 
the first my first question never was how much money do I get. My first question ever was would it be fun? Would I have really fun making music at that place with those people? And be a kind person. Um, be um, be in time. Uh, get your, your 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 gear together. Be professional. Uh, nobody wants somebody that came to the gig and is the best player he can get ever. But the gear is broken. The amp is forgotten in the in the rehearsing room and and all that stuff. And you come one hour too late and all that stuff and. Um, uh, after one hour gigging, you're totally drunk and uh, yeah, things like that. Nobody wants that. And be be professional. Yeah, that's definitely a good advice. Um, do you have? I mean, if you remember all these live shows, and especially all those live shows that you were doing per year, uh, did you have any uh, special way to warm up before the show, or you would just hit it? You would just go and play. Yeah, yeah. Um, normally I like to warm up, but it's not that easy with the upright. Uh, the shows we play are mostly like the, the bass is on the stage. You leave the stage, the audience is getting in, and uh, one or two hours after that happened, or one hour after it happened, you get on stage. So the bass is on stage. You would need a second bass to warm up behind the stage. Uh, so that's not that easy and um, yeah sometimes you come like the very big stages you come uh, to the to the to the venue you have to put your stuff on stage you make a short sound check you start there's no chance to warm up most i have to do it w without warming up i'm um, rubbing my hands like that if it's cold or something like that i'm doing that um, sometimes if it's very cold or i feel I need to be warmed up i have tiger barn I don't know if you know that stuff. It's from Thailand or from Asia, Tiger Balm. And I put it, yeah, it's, um, you get in different colors. It's really not bad if you, if you, uh, if you're hurt on, on the muscles or, or those things. Oh, is it, is it similar to VIX? And no, no, I don't know. Uh, Tiger Balm. Check that out. I mean, if you like. I mean, it's in German. So, but I no, remember that it's, it's from uh, Asia, it's from Thailand. But, I mean, but when you say the name, it's in German, the name, right? No, it's uh, Balm, Balm, B-A-L-M, Tiger, Tiger Balm. Okay, I think that's what we call VIX in America. But, but okay, maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe. Sorry. <laughs> but on, the, on, the, on it, they, they write Tiger Balm on it in, in Asia. Okay. Okay, <laughs> but maybe you call it a different. That, that maybe, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think I should visit America very soon. <laughs> Have you ever been? Uh, in America? Uh, yeah. yeah. Two or three times. One time with the band. Uh, one gig uh, with, uh, in Phoenix, Arizona with the Coasters. We played on a, on a festival with the Coasters. Oh, and, cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> nice story. Uh, we, every time we talk about that, Actually, we have a lot of laughing. <laughs> the PA crew was special. The way they built up the PA system was special. You, every fault you can make, they did. <laughs> and we, oh, we wow. was, uh, we, yeah, it was uh, about 2,000 people there. And we came to America. And uh, you see the German band going to America. It's like, so now we learn something. Yeah. The guys here, they, 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 they are professionals because they they know how to rock and roll. And uh, yeah, we we, uh, we learned something. We, we, we had a lot of respect because of that thing. And we came there and all they did was non-professional. <laughs> and we said, okay, they have it in America too. <laughs> no, I got to say, like, as far as shows that I played, Germany might be the most professional for those, like a smaller, I mean, mid-sized shows. You know, yeah. I got to say, it's, it's, it's great. Um, you know, like we have uh, uh, Mark's Gold. He asked me to ask you about nomenclature and all of that. Uh, but I would like to, to, you to play something so we can continue talking about different uh, slap patterns that you play, if you don't mind. Ooh, um, yeah. Um, what do you want to play now? No, I like to play something uh, weird for me. But... Um, 
uh, I work on that for about four four weeks now, and um, it's um, it's from our friend um, Nicolas Duboucher, and he made an arrangement for a Big Noise of Winnetoka, and I love that so much that I decided some weeks ago to check it out. And uh, when you asked for the show, I said, "Yeah, Nicolas is such a great player. Why not playing something from him?" And um, yeah. Big noise from Minnetoka, and um, I work still working on it, but I do my very best, and there are some interesting slap things in it, I think. <laughs> Did he back a great player? <laughs> ah, yeah, but I do the thing for us. Yeah, he asked for slap things, Mark. Gold. Yes, I wanna uh, I wanna ask you about the different nomenclature that you're playing, um, and um, and thanks for the big noise from Winnetka, and um, it's a it's a it's a cool song. It's the for whoever is not familiar with the original should be, should check out. Uh, Bob yeah. Hoggard, and uh, with uh, he did it with Ray Buttock on drums, really cool. Everybody loves your version, Chuck, Chuck Carner. Hey, Chuck, love you, Mac, Mark's Gold, Brad Back Lounge. Awesome. Um, so I wanna since, since you wrote the book, uh, you published the DVD, um, you studied slap for a long time and you've been playing slap for a long time i want to hear your thoughts how do you call uh different slap patterns and what are the slap patterns that you use are you using the traditional single slap double slap type of thing or you have your own thing and stuff like that so um yeah go me, ahead I, I started playing uh when I started playing with the band, and the only guy I saw was Lee Rocker, and um, uh, yeah, he was playing uh, at the beginning of the Stray Cats. He was a very basic player, I would say nowadays. I think he improved a lot from that time on, and uh, I really love his playing all the time. But uh, at that day, the things I checked out was a double slap. At that time, I called it a single slap because I didn't know how to call it and wasn't in contact with other players, so I played. A note and then the slap. And I called it a single slap because for me it was only one slap, but nowadays I know it's a double slap and the single slap is that. This is something I, in former times, I never used. But when I got those that C DVD, The Ungentle Art, I recognized, oh. And I said, Ooh, that's possible. And I, I put it in, into my playing. And uh, of course, I played triplets. That was very, uh, when you when the people on stage said, okay, uh, the guitar strings broken, play a bass solo. Then you do all. The 
triplets. Or the country style triplet, which is a like that and um, these are the things I played for <laughs> maybe 20 years all the time and um, when I saw uh, the Atomic Boogie your video on, on YouTube and uh, I got that DVD and a lot of slap bass I uh, recognized that drag slap or however it is called and uh, I, I got no idea what how to do it but I recognized that that this would be a possibility. I think I played on stage and uh, lost control <laughs> about my playing because I'm uh, uh, jumping around and uh, the hand did this. And I, and I said, ah, maybe this is the track. But later words I learned that is something different and that it it's for me, it's better to play it in a different way, like I do it with my playing the single slap, and then with the back of my hand, and then clapping the hand, like playing a normal slap. And this was the, the, the way I would like to play a drag nowadays. And um, later words, some people started playing in the internet, uh, talking in the internet about uh, the quadruple slap. And I said, yeah, next time we talk about the eight tuple traps and the 20 triple slaps and so on and so on. But uh, as a teacher, you're mostly asked to know that styles. And um, I said, no, I think I have to check it out. And I checked it out. And the way I play it, I, I think there may be different ways, but the way I play it is playing a single slap. Then with this part of the hand, the first, then with the thumb, the second, and then the normal slap with the flat hand. This is the way I play, I play it. And um, I think there's a different variation of that uh, quadruple slap. Uh, I mentioned before Willie Dixon with You Can't Catch Me. I hope it was Willie Dixon and not that other player. And um, But I think You Can't Catch Me was played by Willie Dixon. And that is... And the point is, now I play a normal country slap style. And now I play a fast 16th combination with and I mute the string here I don't get a tone I mute it this is what I do and I think it sounds very interesting if you play it faster What I use, and um, in in that in that former times when I was younger, um, but I had to use that. What I'm telling about now is um, I had to use that a country player in that club in in my hometown of Schaffenburg. He told me that uh, if the drummer is going to play with, a, with 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 brushes, um, he tries to simulate that with a. But I never practice it too much. Nice idea, but I, there's no use in my band for that. So well, mostly I play a normal double slap in combination with triplets or sometimes with drag slaps. Nowadays I play sometimes um, a quadruple if there's room, but I wouldn't do it in a studio because if the recording video, uh, the bass makes the whole bottom of the music. So uh, it's very necessary that there is a steady bottom. And um, I think those those things, that is not um, 
fulfilling that that um that is nice if you're playing alone if you're playing a workshop of something like that but um and to show hey i know some cool tricks but um in popping b we don't need it so um it's not that necessary yeah this is what i use and that's great. I wanted mostly to hear like what your, how do you uh, call these patterns? And then um, I, I want to collect, you know, different people's opinions and then, you know, figure out. A great uh, idea. A great yeah, idea. yeah. Well, thanks. <laughs> um, I have a question. Lots of people actually, and now I want to be focused a little bit on your gear. So you, you can leave your base. Yeah. Uh, down and then so yeah, sit down. Gear. So um, about your yeah yeah about your gear. Lots of people asked me to uh, reminded me to ask you about development of the Shadow Rockabilly pickup. And I know that your name is listed on the Shadow website. Uh, so I would like to hear how did that process go? How did you? which part was your idea which part was their idea how did you help them out with uh with the whole process and uh, you know just explain everything that was happening i was a shadow endorser for about 20 25 years because um yeah bob and b uh, 200 jobs every year and to be true that and just a question at that time like what which which shadow did you play yeah, at that time I played the old Shadow, um, how's it called? SH950. SH exactly. That, that's my first pickup as well. Yeah. That's why I I'm asking it, you. I have it on my, there is an old K, and the pickup okay. the is about 30 years old. It's the old SH950, and I combine it with, with, with the preamp systems. Yeah. Okay, it, 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 that's what I wanted. You know, because that's the pickup that I played for a long time when I was a kid. All the jazz gigs, all my first swing and rockabilly gigs, I played in that pickup. And for American people that are not familiar with that one, it's um, it's very similar to Underwood. I think it was yes. kind of made made kind of like to be kind of I think they all look alike. Always like uh, we are the first. We are the first. We are the <laughs> like oh, really? I, I think that I Underwood. I'm pretty sure that Underwood was before Shadow, but it, but it doesn't matter. Uh, but I want to hear sure. about uh, development of, of the system that you worked uh, worked you worked on with them. Yeah, and I, I got in contact every uh, the Frankfurt Music Fair is, uh, for a long time was a place. I've uh, been there for three days. Uh, it, it's 50 kilometers from my hometown and uh, away. So and. Um, they know me, uh, they know this is our pickup, uh, bright bass pickup and also, and they, one day I got in contact with them and they, every time I went to them, I said, oh, I have ideas and so on. And one day they went, they came to me and said, yeah, why not meeting? Why not? Um, and I think I, I told them, you see, there is one pickup that is very well sold, uh, is the K&K &K Rockabilly. And, uh, some of my students had the K&K, &K, but sorry to say, they never were lucky with it. They, they didn't like it really. They say, Didi, this is the Rockabilly pickup because it's the K&K &K, and look, there is Rockabilly on it. And uh, so I have to use it because there is Rockabilly on it. Yeah? And, um, and I always said, yeah, put, a, put the preamp away and just use the pickups. I think that would work better. And most of my students say, yeah, you're right. Yeah, without the pre K and K, the preamps, the, the pickups are okay, but the preamp, I think it's mostly which kind of sound you're looking for. And but they they went to pop and B concerts, and they I always try to have a very fat big sound. Like I told before, I have to make the whole bottom of the band. And they said, ah, I want to have back big fat sound too. So I went to Shadow and said, let's try to make. A, uh, an alternative preamp system. It's not good that if there's only one. And uh, they said, yeah, it sounds interesting. Do you have uh, more ideas? And I said, yes, indeed. Uh, I wish myself a rumble filter. I wish myself a tuner in it. I wish myself a 
two channels and the slap channel only with those frequencies and with those possibilities and the tone channel with those frequencies and i was it's necessary to know that bop and b in the first 20 years over half of the gigs i mix i mix the band with a small mackie pull, uh, desk from stage the band went on stage we had a small 16 channel mackie desk and uh, I mixed them from stage so I was very fami familiar with uh, with frequencies and with compressors and all that stuff and I said yeah I want a, a, the low at that point and I want a cue like that and uh, they said wow you know everything so we just have to build it and uh, we, we sat together that was a two-day session drank a lot of beer, had some pizza, had a lot of fun because the guys at Shadow were so fun, great people. And um, yeah, and uh, we made, we made uh, they took my ideas and put it together. And after some weeks, they, they sent me a prototype, I still have it, and it worked very well, two or three things to be. And then we began discussing about uh, things like the battery inside or outside, which kind of battery. And uh, for me, it's very funny to, to read always uh, the jackets, the jackets. Uh, most people say, yeah, why didn't you use normal jackets? And I said, yeah, if I use normal jackets, it get, it's getting bigger. And I think it's big enough. So I don't, I, I'm the asshole. I didn't want it bigger. This is the reason why the battery is outside. If I put it inside, it's bigger. And then the people say, yeah, but that cable from the battery to the pre and uh, sometimes it breaks. And I said, okay, come on. I'm the guy, the first one who ever had one and I use it a lot and uh, my mind never broke. Show me how you fix it on your base and, uh, and tell you what the problem is. And the reason is every time I go to the internet and see people and say, yeah, you preamp, now, the cables are just hanging around. Small cables are just hanging around. And uh, yeah, <laughs> of course they break. One day they break, I promise you. And if I uh, fix that preamp system uh, on my base, all the cables are fixed with those cable, how's it called, cable fixes? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so nothing breaks. And that was, uh, the, we discussed about those things, uh, which material would be the, the, the right one for, for the preamp uh, and all that stuff and which kind of tuning system and so on. And at the end, that's the, what, what went out of it. Uh, and to be true, I'm, I'm still lucky with it. It's uh, a good alternative to the K&K, &K, I would say. Yeah, if you like the K&K sound, there's nothing wrong, but uh, to have only one possibility is not a good idea. It's just... So as for, I, I haven't tried uh, Shadows, the whole system. So what are the options that you have in the, in the box? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, let me have a look. <laughs> no, you have two channels. And um, you have them. Uh, you have a, a volume for each channel. And uh, if, if you have the preamp system hanging on on the on the on the uh, string uh, string tree, the, the the tuner is upside down, so you can see what you're doing. And if you if you put the knob to to uh, to use the tuner, the band is is, is muted. Uh, the preamp is muted. What is very important, and that was an idea of Shadow, is a face uh, face changer uh, knob, which is very, very helpful if you have feedback problems. Um, we have uh, uh, um, on, on, the, on the tone side, we have three knobs with a bass filter, a mid filter, and a presence filter. And we have a pre-shape filter. I knew that one from the old Trace Elliott amps uh, I was using when I was playing slap electric bass. And that is um, that you turn down mids around 600 uh, hertz uh, with a Q about uh, one. I, I don't know exactly. I have I have the, the, the literature on, on, the, on the PC, the old uh, things I wrote them, but I have, should have a look there. And um, uh, we have a subsonic filter. Uh, 
because of, of uh, low frequency problems. And on the flap side, uh, we have a low a low cut that is going up to three kilohertz, I think. And that was something I really wanted because if if you use, in my opinion, uh, if you use the the um, if there is too much bass in the in the in the slap pickup, uh, you get problems uh, with the whole system if you're running over one amp, and um, there are phase 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 problems, and uh, then you can choose um, and and that low cut is uh, you you can choose the frequency where, where it is working, and um, it's a 40, 20, 40 b low cut, and you choose the the frequency. And we have um, a, a, a knob that where you can change the heights you you use uh, four kilohertz or eight kilohertz, and then you can turn them can turn them up if you like to. This is I think this is the whole system. Yeah. The K and K that was something I really didn't like that you always have to put away the K and K, uh, open it and make the settings, and then you put it on the base or leave it open beside and listen and change something. And I wanted knobs that you can use while you're gigging fast, fast changes. This was what I wanted. My, that was the idea. Yeah. I think it's okay. Yeah. Still okay. Um, is that, is that you're still, is that still your favorite system? Yeah. The funny thing is that um, I was, I was playing with Bob and B. I was, for 35 years now, for 36, and um, I never use it with Poppet B. This is really funny oh. for me. Oh, really? But the the thing is, I have um, I had when when we developed that system, I had a very well working system, and I'm the guy to never change a running system, uh, and in, I have a, a rack behind me. And there is a tube preamp and very old PV alpha. I shouldn't should not mention that, but uh, those old PV alphas they sound really great, I think. And um, I have four of them, and they make nice, fat sound. And um, this is in, uh, like to say that the shadow preamp sounds like my old PV. We check that old PV out and uh, try to build that uh, a little bit like that one. And on the click side, um, I never, with Poppy B, um, I have two wireless systems and the, the, the mixer, which is an integral part of the band, um, get those two signals, not only one. And so he can decide what he wants to do. And uh, with Poppy B, I would have a preamp pl plus two wireless systems on my base and that is really too much because I'm really acting with the bass and I'm not getting younger and my sometimes my back is saying um, choose a lighter bass and choose a lighter system and so on. Um, but um, on all other bases I use uh, in studio, uh, if I'm gigging up with other bands, uh, everywhere is the, the shadow and I really still like it. Yeah. If nowadays uh, there's a lot of time uh, gone, until we develop it and uh, have a lot of new ideas, but um, that's not so easy actually in the in the Corona situation. Um, I'm dreaming of crazy stuff uh, we can build with the base and uh, uh, like like uh, the pickups going into a system where you can make the changes with your with your um, with your smartphone. Uh, you can load down the cheap app where you can make all those professional settings with professional compressors and so these are these ideas i have but um that needs a lot of money and um uh, yeah and no corona <laughs> well it's it's cool are you uh so are you kind of like a part of the company shadow are you no 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 okay and you're not getting you're not getting a percentage for your ideas no no <laughs> I got indeed. I got eight free systems. Oh, all this right. Is, but uh, I have to be true. I never asked for money. Uh -huh. Some people they don't understand me. I say doing is the most important thing for me. It's not money. Sure, of of course, absolutely. Um, 
strings your favorite uh what kind of strings do you play different really different um the most most of the time to be true uh, i really play gut strings um at former times i played uh over the years i played uh pyramid gut strings with the wounded or wounded uh, um e string uh and uh the last years i played a frano gut string and um these are on my base now but um their quality it's getting worse in the last years especially the wounded uh e string and um wounded wounded is it wounded wounded sorry and um on the other side i have several bases with gutter like strings um the when when uh, thomas schmucker from gutter like uh, and tube base uh developed those strings uh, we were working together we have friends and uh, he asked me what do you think about it and his ideal are gut strings but uh, he couldn't afford them and on the other side um he didn't like the wheat whackers too much and there at that time there were not so much alternatives and he developed the the gutter likes and then uh, he developed a new way of making the gutter likes that we called them the diddy back that was just for for promotion uh and uh, since then i think he actually has eight different kinds of setups uh, you can uh, can buy and uh, on several bases there are there's one base there are the very new slap kings on on net with with uh, great strings i think or the hapcats uh, also great strings but um and on my pay i have some uh, pirastro if a pirazzi slap actually uh nylon uh wounded uh, nylon strings and on my uh, on my jazz bass i have some yaga strings yaga medium strings yeah i i found them when i was gigging in denmark and my gut strings broke and the only string available in 500 kilometers was a set of yagas and so i was forced to buy them and uh, indeed they didn't sound bad <laughs> so i still use them <laughs> Yeah, Lee Rocker used to play yogurts back in the 80s. And um, sometimes, uh, sometimes I used Tomastic solo spiro chords. Ah, okay. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I change. But when I'm a bit bored with the sound, <laughs> change the strings. But on the You don't you don't have a favorite set. Yeah, on on the Bob and B, on the Bob and B bass, there are uh, always got strings. Ah, okay. Yeah. All right. Um Never change a running system. Well, you're right. Uh as far as amps go, do you have favorites? What yes. is your setup? Yeah, I have uh, I have favorites. Uh I was a long time Trace Edit user, then after that there came SWR and then for more longer time, I think for about 15 years I was using Ampex Stack and SVT2 Pro. Uh, I got an endorsement and I got that 810 uh speaker system and everything in heavy mount racks and uh, that was oh maybe my back problems are <laughs> therefore and um one day uh, I was contacted by a company and they asked me uh, would you like to check out tech amp and I said checking out is always okay um, I don't play it if I don't like it but um so i went to the company and the funny thing was when we were 18 years old the the the, the head of the company thomas eich we were 18 years old we were hanging around the same music store playing level 42 funk licks in what one, one in the one corner one in the other corner and every just looking ah oh, he's faster than me and um uh, 20 years later we met and he was uh, the, the head of the company tech amp and i love that stuff very much the and uh, the garden endorsement uh, and uh, tech amp got some serious problems with uh, with his american distributors and had to change the name and uh, now he's called eich amps eich amplification and i'm still an endorser and i really love that stuff very much of uh, three different stacks uh, thomas is a very supportive man uh, we were i think you don't know that 
short, shortly before Corona, uh, the band Bob and B got dropped. The whole gear was stolen and um, we were totally, we had no money and nothing. And uh, Thomas was the first one to say, you get a new stack and you pay when you have money. And that may not last long, but uh, you pay me when you have money because you need a stack to play. And I think that's great. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah, that's really great. Uh, I paid him now, uh, and he made a what? Well, I'm an endorser, as you know. Nowadays, most endorsements are not that you get the gear totally for free. They say uh, you pay the price. I have to produce it, and I think that's fair for me. And uh, yeah. that's Eich Ems. But normally, when I'm go gigging around, and uh, I would use any kind of amp. I don't like Warwick amps and I don't like Hartke amps. I don't like them. It's not good for, for me, it's not good sounding for upright bass playing. Uh, what do you have in your rack uh, and are you using any pedals? No, no pedals. I have just an old cock tuner, rack tuner. I had uh, a my mostly beloved wireless system was a very old Shure U4D, which was the, the top of the line uh, wireless system uh, 25 years ago. And that thing was on my side for about 4,000 gigs and it never broke down. It always worked without any problems. I think this is the coolest thing I ever had. Wow, the Shure U4D wireless system. But it was stolen. And now it's somewhere else and I had to buy a new one about, about have two sure wireless systems and uh, I have that PV preamp and that's it. And that's it. So sorry to hear about that robbing. I mean, that's, that's the worst, you know, robbing musicians. It's, it's awful. It's just awful. Um, but I'm, but I know I'm glad you're back on your feet and I know that you will be back even more, you know, once the, we all start gigging. Um, as far as bases go, you mentioned that you have 10 or 11 bases. What kind of bases are those? Uh, Upright yeah. bases. Yeah. <laughs> Better. <laughs> not, let's not start with the electrics. Um, okay, my main base is my Duke base. Um, as you may know, uh, there, there's a Duke base called the Didi Beck model. The story behind it is very easy um, because Duke base uh, wanted to be in contact with Toma and the biggest music store in whole Europe and uh, they asked for, for working together and he said yeah I'd like to but I want to check out if they're working well and I don't want to give them my normal line and um, so I make a Diddy Beck model and uh, they can sell that one and if they do a good job they get the rest and uh, they did a good job but from that day on there is a Diddy Beck uh, base available and the first one was the one I was gigging with for about 12 years was a prototype. We had a, a, a white tube base uh, and we're painting it black with those white stripes I always have. And uh, after some years, uh, T Thomas came to me and said, yeah, but now you need to have a regular one, one that's looking a bit nicer. And uh, he gave me that one I use now. And the old one, which was sound, sounding awesome really one of the best bases i really ever had beside my k and uh, the old king uh, that one was stolen uh, yeah and so if anyone ever finds a black base with white stripes with fat white stripes uh, on the sides ask the guy where the base is from <laughs> maybe it's mine and um yeah but i love those tube bases Mm, I have uh, an old K, uh, not an old one, It's I think it's a 58K, uh, but that is a beautiful bass and I bought it uh, when I was the last student in my music school, they g gave it to me for small money 30 years ago. And um, one day after a job, after a gig, a guy came to me and said I, had, I have a upright bass in my house and do you want to have it? Yeah, show it to me. 
he showed it to me and I didn't recognize what I was buying. He said 300 Deutschmark. That was 150 euros at that. And um, I was buying the base and um, brought it to my uh, to my Lufia. And he said, oh, nice. An old King Morton. Never seen one before. And that was a King Morton I have now. I have an uh, old Schönbach uh, base. I don't know where who built it. It's about 150 years old. That is my only um, f- uh, full full wooden base. All the others are um, um, plied, Platon. Is that Platon? Yeah. And um, yeah, and there is one base in the corner. Uh, I don't know where it is from. It looks like an old K, but I think it's it isn't. And I have several Framus, and I have an Engelhardt Link, and a Swingmaster. Uh, yeah, ten bases. <laughs> <laughs> These are the bases. <laughs> that's yeah. that's a lot of bases, man. It's a lot of bases. But some people only, but some people only have one base, and they play great too. So it's not necessary. Believe oh me, yeah, absolutely. The most bases I have I bought for very cheap money because the people came to the Bob and B concert and said, "Yeah, there's a base I don't need. Do you want to buy it?" And I bet no, none of the bases. Paid more than five hundred euros. Oh wow! Yeah, this good is, job. Yeah, thirty-five years of gigging. <laughs> you meet a lot of people, and if 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 father's dying, and they, they, they I don't know how you call it in English when 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 they uh, want to sell the house and they put everything out of it, and oh, an upright place. What shall we do with it? Oh, there's a rockabilly band tomorrow. I asked that guy, and that. That guy is mostly me. <laughs> That's great. Um, I pretty much asked you everything I wanted to ask you. I wonder like, if our audience have something to ask you as well. So now people are still here. So if you want to ask something, be yeah. back. Now is the time. Please do that. Uh, is there something that you wanted to mention that I did not ask you that, you know, that maybe to announce some project or something? Anything is that you know? This episode is about your life, your uh, your career, and your playing style. So I want to cover it as much as possible. So is there anything that we skip? Yeah, not something very special. Um, really, um, the point is the. I have a funny uh, uh, thing to say is uh, I hope one day I really learn playing bass. <laughs> we all do. Yeah. One day, one day, one day, yeah, one day it's, it's for me. It's like uh, like uh, that old story about you climb on a hill, and uh, when you're at the top, you see the next one. And every time I check out all those great music I hear and all those great players, and I say, "Wow, there's something new to learn." And on the other side, that's the beautiful thing. If if I reach the point where where there's nothing more to learn, I, I think I'm so bored. That's not good. And I love to hear all those great musicians outside, all those great players. All Yeah, and this is something I want to say to you. Art of Slap Bass is a beautiful platform to check out those great guys for me. Yeah, I use it for me to have fun with music. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, thank you for being part of it from the very beginning. We have a couple of questions from the, the audience. Uh, is there a chance for a reunion uh, with Sasha, <laughs> I don't think so. He's uh, he's he's too much a pop guy. He made he made a second uh, record, uh, a rockabilly record. But in in the studio, the lawyers were, were part of the recording. You, you see? Oh, okay. Yeah, I think <laughs> from other projects. Uh, if that is a point. Um, Personally, nothing wrong with him, but uh, uh, no. I, I like the, I like what you did with uh, um, if you believe, you know, and, uh, and yeah. the video is cool, and you know, it's yeah. it's very well done, you know, professional yeah. production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really, yeah. I, I'm still loving that one, and uh, but the, the problem is not uh, is not uh, Bob and B. The problem is uh, that Sasha wants to be a pop star, not a rockabilly pop star. Yeah, sure. 
Maybe he, you know, since you're changing your singers that often, you know, maybe you can have Sasha as a singer one day. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, I always hear that he needs a lot of money for his way of living. So maybe, uh, yeah, he joins Bob and But on the other side, you don't really earn money with Bob and P. <laughs> you have a lot of fun, I, I tell you. <laughs> uh, Patrick, Cash Boomer, uh, he asked, when DD comes out your, uh, your second book? When all the guys that have my first book have practiced all the scales in all keys. With all the... <laughs> yeah. No. Um, I'm still thinking about it. And uh, there are some great bass players that they said, uh, I, I will allow you to use my bass lines. Uh, I have to say that I was in contact with Jimmy Sutton. I've uh, transcribed two lines of Jimmy Sutton. I transcribed it to Jive Jack and uh, uh, from, from the first J.D. McPherson record. And um, he said, yeah, it's okay. You can use it for a book. So I have to check it out. And uh, Kim Nicholman also uh, uh, transcribed This Haunted Cat House. Yeah. There is a band called the Fish Tank Ensemble. Uh, I did a transcription of uh, Woman in Sin, and I hope maybe this one will be possible, and uh, several others. And um, yeah, if those things are ready, together with some uh, technical works and uh, with some harmonical works, and uh, then um, the, the new book is ready. But um, you know it, and several other people know it. Uh, to write a book is the one thing, to release it is the next thing, is the next step. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Jose Arana is asking, what song is the most fun for you to play? Ooh, <laughs> that's difficult, that's difficult. Um, mm, with the band, I would say it's, um, yeah, uh, Race with the Devil, that's fun, that's really fun with the band it's from the actual recording because it's a little bit faster and uh, i love that one and lazy bad boy is from the bang album out of 2010 that is really fun to play and um from the other songs wow there are so much songs to play with uh, blue bonnet boogie from uh, high noon is beautiful to play along with and um, that's a uh, very not that difficult but nice bass line is uh, with um, something I said from um, Lou Williams that is uh, always fun to play with. And uh, yeah, sometimes I have a, a day I put on an old Johnny uh, Johnny Burnett record and play along with Rockabilly Boogie. That is always fun to play along and just be that. 20 year old kid and uh, just uh, getting into that kind of music and have the fun and that comes back every time I play those songs. Uh, Stray Cats, why not playing Stray Cats strut? Uh, always fun. Uh, most people play it much simpler than it really is. Yeah. Yeah. These are fun. Uh, Grisha from Demented Argo. Uh, says, I can only say I'm happy that Didi keeps showing his fun on stage. Keep it up. Have you ever thought of the end? <laughs> Which end? <laughs> My end? The end of the stream? <laughs> the end of the world? <laughs> no. Hey, Krisha, nice to hear from you. And uh, let, let me say, Krisha, just, just you, but Krisha is also uh, that guy. is cool and great. And uh, yeah, I never sort of an end, personally. Um, the, the great thing playing rock and roll is that you can get older and it still feels okay. If you're in a, in a um, let's say in a pop band, like a K-pop band, and you, you're over 50 years, that I think that sounds and smells funny. <laughs> yeah, but playing rockabilly, psychobilly, I mean, look at, uh, at, at uh, Sparky, that man, mm -hmm. It's getting better and better the older he went. He is, wow, cool. And uh, yeah, demented I go. <laughs> this is some um, cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, Casey wrote, Didi, your positive attitude and outlook on life is infectious. You're not only a great bass player, but even a better person. Thanks for the <laughs> interview. 
Sweet. Thanks. People love you, man. Yeah, um, you. Yeah, Marcus Schultz wrote, uh, Didi, uh, do you have any tips for a beginner in slap bass? Yeah. The first, last, and the always counting uh, tip is start slow and watch your right hand doing the right things. Um, most people start playing too fast. When they come from the electric bass or when they come from the upright bass and they are better players, uh, they play jazz or something like that, and, and the most of them start to play too fast, play very, very slow. This is all my students, they come to me and uh, they, they say, mostly they say, yeah, I can play that slap style, but after one or two minutes, my hand, I can't move it any longer. It's so, and the shoulders and everything, I got problems. And I, and I say, you have to play slow and then watch your, watch your technique and be very, very slow, very slow. Move your hand very slow, the whole hand with the shoulder. Some players don't do that, but um, they don't need it that much. And especially to, don't get me wrong in the, in the in the psychobilly scene if you if you play uh, those nylon strings like the weed whackers there's a di this is a different kind of sound i respect very much and a different kind of way of playing but uh, if you like that rockabilly style with maybe let's say uh, gut strings or steel strings or, or fat nylon strings like the gutter lights uh, then uh, start slow start slow yeah this is what I would recommend to you. All right, I have one more question, but before that, I'll still ask you to play a little bit more. Do you mind? Yeah, well, so uh, the, the problem was, don't get me wrong, George, but uh, you asked me one day ago, and uh, so I don't have too much. <laughs> um, uh. But I play one more joke thinking, is that okay? Everything is okay coming from you, man. See, yeah. people love your attitude, you know, they just see you smile and they're happy. So, you know, if you play, they're even happier. So it's all yeah. good. But you see, but you see, the point is I'm smiling because I'm playing upright slap bass. And this is, if you start playing upright slap bass, you get that smile too. <laughs> uh. <laughs> it's infectious. It's the instrument, not me. <laughs> it is, it is. Okay. Just think... move, move. If you don't mind, just move to the middle of the screen. If that would be great. Or you can do that. Yeah, it's uh, Alabama, Alabama Jubilee. Oh shit, I started again. Sorry, 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 sorry. One go the next one. Okay, I play one more small because hey, George, I didn't know that Ryan is in that thing. Ryan Gould, and um, I saw Ryan Gould on the Art of Slap Bass, and uh, that one I really checked it out. Just 
for the introducing. Ryan Gould, <laughs> hey, I really love that. I can play it better, but I have to check it out one or two times. <laughs> I really love that when I saw it on our flat day. Oh, man, everybody loves it. You know, Tara Jackson, Casey, Redback Lounge, Patrick, Mark's Gold, Lea. Oh, Lea. Jose. Is on you know Lea? Uh, I don't know her personally, no. Oh, she's also very well known in Germany. Like, she's really well known. Yes, yes. Uh, some friends of mine from Mexico told me about her, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, so, she, how, she, hi, Leah. Yeah, hi, Leah. She, uh, she does a lot of workshops uh, f uh, in her hometown, Cologne. Yeah, and uh, there are not so, not so many um, female bass players actually in Germany, but uh, the, the number is growing, especially because of Leah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's cool for, I think, too, yeah. Absolutely. We need more female slappers. Absolutely. So Absolutely work yeah. on that, Leah. Yeah, she, um, she does. She does. <laughs> awesome. All right, so I have one more question for you. Thanks for all these playing. Thanks for being part of the art of sled bass is basically very beginning. Whoever haven't seen your episode, you know, it's still on YouTube. Just, just type DD, the, uh, DD back art of sled bass and it's going to pop up. And, um, thanks for being part of the slap stream. Thanks for joining me in Slapsville. <laughs> it was a pleasure hosting you. Sorry for, uh, these technical difficulties at the very beginning, but you know, now I know how to stream from my phone. So, uh, so things going to be easier. And before we finish this, uh, I would like to ask you what inspired you to still do what you do after all these years, after 36 years of playing in popping B after, you know, I guess 40 years of playing music and all of that, especially after this last year, when we, when they're trying to convince us and tell us that we are not essential. So <laughs> uh, what, Makes next you keep up, it going. The next virus, the next virus that will come. I wish something that uh, that uh, we are forbidden to drive car or to use weapons. Okay, <laughs> we will die by using weapons because the virus is. You know what I mean. And uh, no, what keeps me going on is uh, simply the fun of it. This is something I say very often, but it, it's like that. And uh, to say it a bit, uh, to go a bit deeper. Uh, when I grew up, I was uh, the, the the small boy of a work, small worker in in my small hometown, and um, I got those funny teeth, like a Freddie Mercury looked like. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, I, I, I thought, what what would life bring me? And one day I decided, don't matter what life will bring me, but I will make music, and that was the best decision I ever made. Uh, beside my wife and my two sons, of course. But um, making music is the best thing I ever did. And uh, it's a gift every day. And I'm standing up uh, and go to my room and start practicing, start writing a song uh, and, and do things around music. And this is, yeah, it gives me a sense in life. Yeah, and it's um, my way of leaving something back when I'm, when I go one day, <laughs> maybe like that. And um, yes, uh, and play, especially playing slap bass, I played the electric, I love playing the electric, and um, but uh, the slap bass, the slap upright bass is so much energy, so much power, is so much, uh, yeah. It's like I feel when I go on stage, it's like, like a big bomb exploding or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> this keeps me going on and the hope that things get better. And, um, there's a one a German, a German, uh, very old German guy always said, um, um, at the end, I hope things will get better. And if it don't get better, it's not the end. This is what Karl Valentin said. And uh, this is something <laughs> I like very much. So I think this all is not the end, actually. And uh, I think um, one day people will see that music can heal their souls 
any kind of good music, any kind of rock and roll, rockabilly, and of course, great slap bass players and yeah, can heal their souls. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> As an answer. Absolutely, absolutely. I love it. Thanks so much for everything. I can't wait to see you again live, you know, so we can hang out again uh, yeah. and talk uh, more bass. And, you know, we'd love to hear you play with your band as well. So hopefully that's going to happen soon. You know what I'm looking for to see you, you know? Tiger Army never die. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, Thank no. you. But not only, but not only because of that. Um, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's great to meet uh, persons like you, like bass players, like kind persons from all over the world, and to see I'm not alone. And all they, right, man. Yeah. Hey, Jordan. that's good. Th thanks a lot. You know, people love you. You know, you know, I love you. It's great. You know, let can't wait to hang with you. And good luck with everything. Good luck with your family, with your music, with base and and hope to see you soon yeah you too have a great time and uh, hope things get better soon yeah it definitely will <laughs> and and good good night good night <laughs> yeah <laughs> how's it saying in Serbia? in Serbia in Serbia we say laku oh oh difficult laku noc yeah excellent <laughs> see you I, awesome you, thank you bye all right that was 48th episode of the slab stream with georgia live from slapsville um thanks so much for being here you know two weeks ago i had to skip one episode my guest actually broke his arm and it was impossible to find a replacement and then I just decided to skip it. I didn't even bother too much like talking about it. Um, and but I received lots of emails, you know, if I was fine, especially if I since I um uh streamed that interview of Slam Stewart. So I was not live for two two weeks. So thanks about all your concerns, but I am fine and everything is cool. Uh Slap Stream is continuing and uh, thanks a lot for your support if you did not click that subscribe button on my channel make sure to click on it because that really helps um youtube algorithm and if you like the video and write a comment if you want if you want to, uh, want to tell me who to feature next make sure to write down under the video so that's what i can check actually these live chats are cool, but they're good like for the uh, for the duration of the video. I don't usually go back and check those. They're uh, a little bit harder to find on YouTube. But if you write down the comment under the video, I'll check it out for sure. Um, thanks to everyone that bought Art of Slab Base t-shirts, black and red. I even don't have a black one. I have to get one. So I don't wear always the the, the red one. Um, since I'm in Europe, I'm gonna be able to 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 ship them once I go back uh, to to the states. So so you can still pre-order it. And if you're interested in Didi Bag's book, make sure to uh, go to artofslabbase.com and get one. I wrote a, a a review of the of the book, and uh, it's an excellent book. Check it out. You should have it if you don't. Excellent attitudes in it. And um, please uh, support the channel via Patreon. The link is under in the description. And if you want, you can also do donations via PayPal and Venmo. So um, all those links are in the description of the video. And in the meantime, don't forget, never fret, slide it in smooth, and keep it in the groove. I'm George, and I'll see you next Saturday.